Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, October 11th, 2012 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and uh, we have just um, uh, convened uh, and come out of an uh, executive session and we're back in the regular meeting. Um, let's begin uh, the meeting by having the roll call for the regular meeting. Present. Mr. Alden Moore. Here. Ms. Lee Ball. Present. Mr. Michael Flynn. Here. Mr. Dan Meyer. Present. Ms. Lisa Minnick. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Stephanie Trick. Here. Mr. Andrew Shelfo. Here. Mr. Ezra Huff. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, next move on to the public comment period. I have a sign-up sheet um, in front of me and I have a three-minute timer which we can use. Um, I'll ask you um, to state your name and address for the record. And the um, first speaker this evening is Jennifer McKenna. Good evening, my name is Jennifer McKenna. I'm at 89 Florence Street in Leeds. I was here in September to speak to a later high school start time. Excuse me. Okay. Can you hear me? I okay. can hardly hear you, either into the mic or just a little louder. Okay. The mic is not, yeah. is not amplified. No, 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 That's no, just no, for no, the no, television. Don't do that. Yeah. that I already did. Is that okay? Can you hear me? On? It's a, no. no. The microphone isn't for us. It's for the television. Yeah. Uh, well, then just talk. Just ask you Okay. Can you hear me now? Well enough. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I was here in September to speak to a later high school start time, and I'm back on that issue. Uh, I hope to learn tonight that you'll take action to approve either an 815 high school start time, the proposal that was brought last time tweaked to minimally affect the JFK community, uh, or an 8.30 high school start time which no, with no change to the JFK schedule. Uh, if that um, pushes back <clears throat> high school bus pickup time, that would be fabulous. I'm paying $30, $300 for a bus pass, can't use it in the morning because it's too early for my child, and the afternoons he has to stay after many days after school anyway. Um, many parents have this dilemma. Either one of these proposals will make this crucial change. There's no question that a later high school start time is in the educational interest of our children. You've all acknowledged that the research demonstrates clear and powerful educational benefits of a later high school start time. Higher test scores, grades, SATs, greater motivation, greater enjoyment of learning. Uh, as, and as you know, the implications of the start time go even further, affecting teens' very health and safety, physical wellness, levels of depression, risk for driving and biking accidents. In all, this change is nothing less than imperative. Adjustments to family routines and logistics will be part of making this change, weighed against the overwhelming academic health and safety benefits to our kids. I don't think there's any contest over which is more important. Neither of these proposals will cost anything, as far as I understand. The bottom line, I want my child to have as rich and invigorating and successful a career as he can possibly have at Northampton High School. He's one of the kids whose circadian rhythm phase shift kicked in last year. He's struggling in the mornings. His grades have been affected. His teacher, his early morning teacher has said to me, he's getting paler and paler in the mornings. Is there anything you can do? Um, tried melatonin. He's a disciplined kid. Other parents have suggested Benadryl at night and coffee in the morning. I don't want to be drugging my child to meet this schedule. Um, the too early high school schedule tar start time is a clear obstacle to his, his maximizing his high school career. I think that's true for other kids as well. We've had testimony to that. 53% of high school kids in Northampton say they're falling asleep some of the time or a lot of the time in high school. If 53% of you all were falling asleep at work during the day or in these meetings, it would be a problem that would need to be addressed. It's a problem that needs to be addressed in our high school. And it can be addressed. We've got two proposals that could work. In the face of incontrovertible research findings that a later start time will improve academic, health, and safety outcomes for our high school students. In the face of unanimous reports of increased academic achievement by other districts that have moved to a later start time. I implore you to make this change. It's long overdue. Please vote this month to institute a later start time at the high school effective September 2013. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
the next, uh, well, there's actually two people signed up, but I'm assuming you want to go back to back. So uh, Kathy Hanauer and then Dan Jones. Yeah, you know what? I'll speak for both of us, but I'll use less than six minutes. How about that? Is that okay? Um, less than five. We generally don't let people. Uh, you can take over halfway through. He's, not gonna, he's gonna take longer to get through. Well, the rules we generally don't yet let people yield their time to other people. So um, I think Dan would have to come up there and follow behind you. So, yeah. I'm just. Those are the rules of okay. the committee. So. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready. <laughs> Go. As you all probably know by now, my name is Kathy Hanauer, and I'm the author of four books and the mother of two NHS students, a senior and a freshman. I'm sure you're all sick of seeing me up here talking about the high school start time, and believe me, I'm sick of being here. First time was in 2007, when the now high school senior, my daughter, was still in middle school. It's too late now for her, but it's not too late for my son. And when I hear people say, as I have recently, that if a later start time doesn't pass now, this issue will go away, I just shake my head. Because I can tell you this is not going away. The people in this town who know the facts about teens and sleep, and there are more coming up every day, will not stop fighting until this unpleasant, unhealthy, and counterproductive to learning start time, the high school, has changed. Many of us are parents, and parents don't stop fighting for something that will help their kids, or fighting against something that's hurting their kids, physically, emotionally, and educationally. My son, the freshman, is a straight-A student who soaks up knowledge and loves to learn, who has good friends and who, as a freshman, plays on the JVA soccer team. He loves the challenge of hard classes, loves being treated with respect by the staff and teachers at NHS, and he's nice, he's a good kid, he loves dogs, he volunteers at the Survival Center. He's also 14 years old, and as a young freshman, he just started his growth spurt. He weighs 87 pounds. His brain and body are growing dramatically, most of all at night, and every medical expert out there will tell you he needs eight to nine hours of sleep a night to grow and develop properly. And that's what he'd have gotten 30 years ago before they changed school busing to a three-tiered system and made high schools the earliest of the three so that five-year-olds didn't have to stand outside for their buses at 6.15 a.m. So now the 14 and 16-year-olds do that. And the result, thanks to the teenage time clock, as we all know well by now, is that they get one to three hours less sleep a night than they used to, and ADD, ADHD, and obesity, not to mention absenteeism, tardiness, and depression are all exponentially worse than they used to be. Drug use for these sleep deprivation caused conditions is rampant, and NHS is no exception. You can buy Adderall like candy at NHS. This is true. I can't tell you the number of kids I know who took these drugs last week for their SAT, which was held at 7.45 a.m. My son rarely falls asleep before 11 at night because that's how his teenage time clock works. He drags himself from bed at 6.40 a.m., comes down grumpy and exhausted, forgets things he needs that are right in front of his face. One morning last week, as he tried to put in his contact lenses with his eyes swollen from being woken at what, for a teenage boy, is the adult equivalent at 4 a.m., of 4 a.m., he said to me, I hate school. Every mother, every, every mother knows these words are like a dagger in your heart. My son is not a kid who should hate school. But this is how he feels when he has to get up this early, when he has to go to school sleep deprived for what for him is the middle of the night. Late, later that day, I asked him, you don't really hate school, do you? And he hesitated then said, mostly I just hate first period because I'm so tired. Yesterday morning, as I watched him try to force himself awake, I said, go back to bed. He thanked me profusely, fell back to sleep until 9.30, and then got up refreshed and went to school in time for the middle of second period. Reset. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, Dan. <laughs> 7.30 30 is not a smart time, a healthy time, a safe time, or a humane time to start school. And now, finally, after years of this battle, every school committee member claims to know this. So then why are we still doing it? Why is this change so insanely hard to vote to make? We have proposals before us. They don't cost money. They don't hurt, hurt athletics. They don't hurt Smith classes. All the obstacles that have hindered this in the past have been removed by the superintendent. All it takes now is courage, the courage to make a good, smart, safe, and important change. Will you rise to the challenge of that, or will you let Amherst do it without us one, and once more leave us in the dirt? Will you accept mediocrity, or worse, particularly for low-income kids who don't have the option, like the mayor and myself, of driving our kids to school so they don't have to catch a 6.15 a.m. bus, or picking them up after school so they don't have time to take a bus home that leaves five minutes after the school day? Will you accept this sad, unfair status quo and go down as the school committee that voted for that? 
or will you be the school committee that finally, like so many now nationwide, reverses this harmful, damaging change of the past and brings us back to a start time that leads to health, excellence, and thriving for all families? You have one good proposal on the table, number three, that gives our teenagers a net benefit of 405 hours more sleep over the seven years of middle and high school. It makes a small change to one school, a change that likely can be tweaked even smaller in exchange for a huge change at another that will benefit every single public school kid in Northampton. You can vote for this right now and be done with this mess. Or you have another proposal, possibly even better, that will likely come up tonight. It surely won't be perfect because life isn't perfect, but life can be a lot better than it is now for our kids if you change the high school start time. Please pick one of these good proposals. Please don't let adult politics take precedence over health, the health and success of our children. Please do the smart and right thing here. Change the start time and do it now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. Um, okay. So the next speaker is Jim Herity. My name is Jim Harrity from 225 Nonatuck Street in Florence, and I'd like to comment on the start time and a couple of other things. Um, and in theory, I'm in favor of, you know, changing to a later start time if it can be reasonably implemented. Um, and I think that's the key is if it's reasonably implemented. But but first, I'd like to. Um, it's my understanding that. The, the committee gave the superintendent a positive evaluation um, over for, for his last year, and I would concur with that. And um, anybody that would hire my wife um, has to be doing something, right? <laughs> um, but one of the things I really uh, like about what's been implemented is the theory of action in the school improvement plan. And it's, it distills the uh, the essence of what you know needs to be done in a school year, um, and it's clear, and it's a lot different than what it used to be in the past. And so, as I look down the school improvement plan, there's a lot of you know big things there. You know, the six strategic areas: teacher evaluation, implementation of new instructional models, establishing benchmarks, amongst others. And then I, you know, one of the other things I do for fun is. I look at what makes for, for a, a, an effective school committee. And I look at the things that the school committee is responsible for, and it's you know, working on a vision, standards, assessments, accountability, alignment, climate, collaborative partnerships, continuous improvement. And I look at that in a school improvement plan, I say, wow, you guys got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of responsibility, a lot of things to do. And so I ask myself, is, you know, how, how did we get here with the school start time? Um, how is it that it took years and every time it comes up it sucks the air out of the room? And I don't ask that question rhetorically. I think it should be part of your evaluation, your self-evaluation when, when it comes time to evaluate the committee work. It's not part of the school improvement plan. It's a subcategory of a subcategory of what a, an effective board would do. And so I think the time allocated to this has been disproportionate. I know a lot of research has been talked about in the effectiveness of school start times, but very strong, rigorous research in terms of third grade reading, transitions from fifth to sixth grade, from eighth to ninth grade, um, huge areas that show if these issues aren't addressed, kids actually drop out of school. Um, a lot of time, energy, and resources should be allocated towards lifting our district out of level three status. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to be done. Um, so I encourage you to please make a decision. Um, get on with the business of governing our district. But let's hope that the passion and the community engagement can stick around. Thanks. Thank you. The next speaker is Steve Harrell. I could give them free ice cream that they changed. <laughs> <laughs> Never talked about that. Uh, 
don't think I can do it. <laughs> Did you push the starter yet? I'm, I'm waiting for you to start, Steve. I think I've seen you all somewhere before. Uh, I'm ready. Okay, <laughs> proceed. Good evening. My name is Steve Harrell, and I live at 474 Elm Street. In addition to what we heard at the last school committee meeting, the superintendent recently said in his blog, quote, our administrative team remains resolute in their unanimous support of leaving the start times as is. This aroused my curiosity. It aroused my curiosity because at the same meeting, we heard Na Principal Nancy Athis stand right at this podium and say, you have to know I support later start, given the fact I've worked on it for four years. I think it's important what the research says. Then Principal Leslie Wilson said, the administrative team really does support, we understand the research, and we do support the late start time at the high school. Of course, they both added that they could not support an earlier start at JFK, but that's not the point here. These two important members of the administrative team don't sound like they are definitively opposed to later starts. Next, I thought about JFK uh, Assistant Principal Sal Kanata. I worked with him on the Superintendent's School Start Hours Committee in 2008. I specifically remember Sal expressing clear support for a change making reference to both the research and his own experience. Also, at the high school, I participated in small meetings several times with Assistant Principal Brian Lombardi, along with Nancy Athis and Renee Wettstein. Brian was always plainly in favor of a later start time. He was working on logistics with Nancy and was ready to cooperate to help with the change. I also wondered why the elementary principals and others on the team would be resolutely opposed. How familiar are they all with the issues and the evidence? Maybe actually it's all about some internal politics, but I sincerely hope this would not guide a decision about what's best for the students. Fortunately, it's not in the hands of the administrative team. In the school committee's policy manual, in the powers and duties section, it says, the committee is responsible for the development of policy as guides for, as guides for administrative action. Note it does not say the administrative team is responsible for the development of policy. And in the school committee's code of ethics, it says a school committee member should realize that his or her primary responsibility is to the children. It does not say that the member's primary responsibility is to the administrative team. It says to the children. In fact, uh, the entire, in the entire policy manual, there is not one reference about the establishment of the team or description of its role. Therefore, I ask you to think about what our children need and not about the reported position of the administrative team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Zach Dietz. Hi, my name is Zach Dietz. I live on 222 Elm Street. Uh, I think it can be said that that throughout the last like five or so years, everything that can be said about the school start time <laughs> has been said at this podium. So I'm not really gonna tell you the facts right now. I mean, it's obvious a later start time would help the students. You all know that. And, I mean, starting at NHS this year, I'm a freshman. It's really been the first time that I can say I hate school. And um, really the first time ever I've just been sad constantly. Uh, yeah, and I'm tired all the time. I have headaches. It's it's really just not nice. And I mean, I don't hate school because of the work or because it's hard. I don't hate it because I don't hate it because I don't like learning because I love to learn. But I hate it because just when I'm at school, it really feels like torture the way my body feels and when I, at night, every night I don't want to go to bed because I get an energy burst. I want to do stuff then. At night I can do my homework, 
but I know if I'm doing my homework at night, that means I'm gonna be so painfully tired in the morning when I try to wake up and it's just gonna make the rest of my day horrible until I get that energy burst at night. So I'm forced in this like catch 22 situation. If I follow my body, what it's telling me to do, I can't uh, live up to the, the live up to the way that the school hours are forcing me to do. And I mean, I really just hate it, honestly. I, I feel depressed and this is the first time in my life that I've felt that way. So I'm really begging you guys to make a change. Um, please, later the school start time at like any means necessary. Um, and as to uh, the idea that if you guys vote it down today, that it's not gonna, it's just gonna end there. There's like a whole sea of crazy moms out there and crazy parents <laughs> who will never, ever let it end. They will take it to their graves. <laughs> so do the right thing, end this tonight, and please later start time for the students. Thank you, Zach. Uh, next up, um, uh, one of those crazy moms, <laughs> <laughs> Renee Wetstein. I only got three minutes, don't I get an extra minute? Um, okay, when I get, you should you should like do the, well, you know what, don't time it yet. But I was thinking Obama, <laughs> Obama <laughs> needs you for all the debates. You are so good at those three minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, and again, uh, just for the audience at home, this is Zach's mom, so I, that was the <laughs> reference to, uh, to crazy mom, so. Thank you. Okay. Renee Wetstein, 222 Elm Street. I'm urging you tonight to vote yes for an 8.30 a.m. start time for the North Haven High School and a bus pickup time that makes the most sense for our students that stay extra for help, need a quiet place to do homework in the library, or who are doing sports and want to be involved in many clubs and offerings. Mr. Salsa had four advertised public forums this past year. Two were held at North Hampton High School, one at JFK, and one at Jackson Street Elementary School. All forums, four forums were well attended and were actually filmed. During the first forum, Mr. Salsa presented a shift in the high school time, but concluded that the cost would be about $180,000. The crowd was very disappointed that the plan presented by a school committee member was not vetted or analyzed by Mr. Salsa and his team. At the second meeting, Mr. Salsa incorrectly stated that the proposal for combining high school and elementary school busing was not possible because every bus holder required a seat. After an op-ed letter, Mr. Salsa acknowledged that he was provided incorrect information and that indeed we should provide busing on the number of students who actually take the bus, which is a lot less than the issued passes. Remember the high school buses? Um, passes of over 200 for the high school and only 121 were actually counted when we did the count. This year I urged attendance to be taken on the buses, but it never happened. At the third forum, Mr. Salsa told the audience that he was disappointed that the last two forums didn't flesh out any new ideas or solutions. He even publicly criticized ideas I put in writing to him. Many parents pushed Mr. Salsa to have a meeting with all the right players to come up with a solution, with bus routes, times, etc., to come up with a plan. Mr. Salsa did not like that idea. Lo and behold, at the last forum, Mr. Salsa comes up with a plan that although not perfect, because JFK would start 15 minutes earlier, but one that was acceptable to the advocates. Principal Wilson was not at that forum, and the people that attended that forum thought that the proposal was discussed with the principals before Mr. Salsa made this proposal at the forum. During the last school committee meeting, many members expressed their concerns about negatively impacting JFK start time and the need for students to sleep. When Mr. Myers suggested why not an 8.30 a.m. start time, what did you consider that, Mr. Salzer? And that impact would not impact JFK start time. Another member thought that was disrespectful. Well, I suggest that it is not disrespectful, but crucial to solve this problem that all of you have publicly expressed you want to fix. Mr. Salzer emailed me the day after the school committee meeting and wrote to me that the 8.30 a.m. start time will work and not impact the start time of the other schools However, the pickup time is the problem. Well, the present 205 pickup is a problem now, and if we can solve the school start time issue by allowing our tired students to get an extra hour of sleep without adding more buses or more costs, and they will have the benefit of having time to stay after school to 
take AP help and a lot of help that they do. I think we finally have a solution to our problem. Our children's health, welfare, and safety depend on it. I have two seconds left. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, that completes the, uh, the public session sign-up list. Is there anyone else who didn't sign up who wishes to speak in the public comment session? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the rest of the agenda. Um, are there, okay. <laughs> if you could just state your name and address for the record. Sure, Jana Ugoni, uh, 35 Norfolk Avenue. I'm a terrible public speaker. I'm doing this because I love my kid. So I vote for proposal number three. I came last time at the meeting and I listened to every one of you and I thought you had some incredibly insightful things and I thank you for that. I feel like proposal number three is very reasonable. It's a start time that doesn't upset the sports too much so kids get home too much later. It's a big help for after help because the kids can take their bus home. Although it, does, it is a small inconvenience for the 15 minute earlier start date for JFK, it's a short lived inconvenience that I'm sure the students will be grateful for in high school. In terms of a possible risk of harmony between the two schools, I feel that in terms of teamwork, I feel that the school committee who we've all voted for, if you guys vote for this, I can't imagine that anything done for the welfare of our kids, which you will believe in if you vote for it, wouldn't bring a cohesiveness and true teamwork to everybody involved. On behalf of our kids, which is why we're all here, I would love for you to start that time a little later. My kids are both um, challenged with learning uh, styles and they work so hard. They're up till at least 11, 11.30. My daughter made high honors last year and it's a it's an all-out family effort when they have to get up that early and go to bed that late. It's a workout. And for all of us who run businesses, I've, we have probably we have two businesses in our family and uh, maybe one too many sometimes. But it's a lot. And I can tell you that probably sometimes their parents that aren't coming to these meetings, they're overloaded. They're overworked. Some people who are afraid to change, they're just afraid to change because we finally got our fragile little systems in place and we're afraid to make a, different, make a change because it takes so much work to do that. But I guarantee you, this small change, which, by the way, I have parents talking about change who have children that went to JFK and now they're, in, they're freshmen, and their kids are a wreck with waking up that much earlier. This proposal number three would bring the start times a little closer and in their favor as adolescents. It would be a smoother transition which I didn't think of until my parent, but these parents and friends of mine discussed how exhausted, and they are saying just what you're saying, thank you for speaking up, because the kids are a wreck. These are kids that are really motivated, and they're exhausted, and they're tired. They just don't want to get up that early. It comes just down to that. They just need a little bit more time, especially with the PSATs and SATs starting at 7.30. These are really valuable things for them to be sharp. I don't want to give my kids espresso in the morning. I really don't, and they are charged at night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Carrie Baker. I live at 65 Paradise Road, and I have two sons, a 10th grader and an 8th grader. I wrote all of you and only heard back from two. Thank you, Blue and Howard. I appreciate it. I've come to all of these meetings but never said anything, so I figured this was my maybe my last chance. Um, we know that it's the best thing for our kids. And I can say personally, having my sons personally have really suffered from um, my elder son from having to wake up so early. You're a group of very smart people. You can figure it out, okay? Be a role model for our kids. Show how a group of smart people can figure out a problem. You know what the science says. You can figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? OK. Thank you all to everyone who, uh, who spoke. And uh, we'll now move on to the, uh, to the rest of the agenda. Um, are there any announcements from school committee members? OK. Mr. Moore? 
Um, it's a quick announcement regarding NCTV. Um, I'm the school committee's uh, board member on the NCTV board. There's going to be a celebration of uh, NCTV having its studios for five years at the high school. And uh, prior to, it's really also, in addition to being at the high school for five years, it's also seen a tremendous amount of growth and a lot more community involvement. The celebration is October 20th from 2 to 4 in the afternoon behind the high school. There will be food and um, speakers, including um, one high school student who's produced a film that you can actually see on the website if you'd like, um, as well as a chance to operate some of the really cool gear that they have at the um, station. So from 2 to 4, Saturday, October 20th, food and an opportunity to um, operate expensive electronic devices. Are there any other um, school committee announcements? on the agenda for later. Okay. So um, while it's it's not on the agenda, um, it normally would be, but we um, wanted to just announce that we are joined this evening by Sarah Moss Horowitz and Alex Rifkin, who are our two new student representatives um, to the school committee. Uh, so we welcome you both. Um, and I believe they're going to sort of deliver a joint report this evening uh, in honor of their first meeting. <laughs> so we'd like to thank everybody for us being here. We're very excited. Um, we're both seniors this year, so it's a big year for us. Um, this is a very stressful time. In October, we have a lot of college stuff going on, so we are very stressed. Um, <laughs> but in terms of the entire school, there's a lot of good things going on right now. Um, one of the big things is Booster Week, which is starting uh, next week with a Powder Puff game, which is a giant uh, football game between the seniors and the junior uh, girls. And so it's a fun time for the school to kind of come together, represent your grade, We'll have games throughout uh, the week of the 22nd through lunch. Um, it's just a little school activity where we get to build spirit throughout of, uh, all the grades. And it's just a time to kind of relax, get some of the stress out, and enjoy the school uh, rather than just doing homework all the time. We have this relaxing uh, period of a week. And it is a good time. It is a little break um, before October, uh, end of October, and kind of just release some of that stress. Also, another thing I want to mention quickly is um, at this time, this week, we have an exchange program going on with, the, um, with a school in Norway, which we've been doing for the last uh, three years. And it's a very good program. It sends 14 of our students over to Norway uh, for two weeks for them to learn about culture and politics over there. And this week and part of next week, those students are here on exchange. The 14 students from Norway at the school are here learning about all, uh, our school politics, culture, they'll be watching the debate uh, next week, the presidential debate. So fun stuff like that. And today they actually got to go to Boston and explore some of the history there. So it's a good time for us, uh, a good program that's been going on where we have this culture exchange and uh, definitely a good learning experience that has been going on for the last three years. Um, and other things going on, uh, we, you may have heard about the Black Box Theater, um, which we have a parent, a lot of parents, and also um, Mr. Eldridge have put a lot of time and, and, and money into it. Um, there were some problems. We had, it was flooded, but we're working on um, getting it back together because we have quite a few student productions um, that are, be, are actually being auditioned for it right now, so that's exciting. Um, the musical, Alice in Wonderland, Lady and Maxime's, um, so that's exciting for the spring. Um, in terms of clubs, um, we have we have a lot of clubs at our school, um, and recently a lot of them have been very active um, and been doing some really interesting stuff. Um, the robotics club was um, in the news a lot last year, and they're doing it again this year, um, even though um, we have a change in advisor. But um, they're they're working on things again. Um, also, Model UN um, is going is pretty active. Um, we're going to some conferences. Um, STAND. Yeah, um, STAND is uh, one of the groups on and it's to help raise awareness about genocide and this year we're focusing on Syria and the issues over there. We're trying to get speakers um, and hopefully assembly to kind of build knowledge about that but i have also like to say that uh, both me and Sarah can agree that as freshmen we were not really well kind of 
we didn't participate that much in these clubs and this year it is astounding how many freshmen and underclassmen in general have taken up these opportunities and it's a great thing and it shows how much how unified the school is that when we were freshmen we really didn't know that much about these clubs or didn't really talk too much about uh, or kind of uh, talk with the upperclassmen and with advisories that have been going on for the last two years and these uh, freshmen joining clubs it is very very uh, unified and we have I've gotten to know a lot of the new freshmen that have come in it's only been a month now uh, but a lot of them have come in and made the transition nicely from the middle school to the high school in terms of this uh, culture and uh, kind of this group setting so I think it's it's been a good month for them and hopefully that continues throughout their high school stay um, so those are just a few of the clubs um, and then also advisory groups um, so, as I'm sure you guys know, um, we have new advisory groups, and so um, we've had two meetings so far, um, and now it's a little bit different. They rotate throughout the day. Um, we're kind of playing around with how that works out. Um, and they are, new freshmen are integrated into groups, which is, it's, 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 it's a very cool thing because you have a group of people that um, is kind of oddly assorted and gets to know each other and new freshmen are kind of integrated into that. Um, and we just want to highlight that one of our um, next topics is academic integrity. So we're, we're trying to address more serious issues. So, yeah, Excellent. I think we're good. Thank you both for that report and we'll look forward to having the both of you joining us uh, throughout the rest of the season, the school year. Okay. So we'll now move on to um, the consent agenda, uh, recommended actions under the con consent agenda. Uh, we have the approval of the minutes of the school committee and alt retreat, August 1st, 2012, uh, and the school committee school committee meeting of Thursday, September 10th, 2012. That's September 13th. Uh, excuse Sorry, me, September 13th. Um, uh, in terms of contracts, uh, we have one contract which I should have pulled out here in advance. Um, I'll move on uh, while I find that. We have field trip requests. We have NHS uh, WGBH TV Boston, Saturday, November 3rd, 2012. Um, we have a Leeds Nature's Classroom uh, trip to Beckett, Mass, November 6th through the 9th of 2012. We have NHS uh, New York City Broadway trip, November 28th, 2012. We have NHS Vermont Prehistory Academic Tournament um, uh, in December 7th, 2012. We have a JFK trip to New York City Broadway April 10th, 2013. Uh, we have NHS uh, trip to Washington, D.C. May 2nd through the 5th, 2013. And we have a JFK uh, French class trip uh, to Montreal uh, and Quebec, Canada uh, May 24th through the 26th of 2013. Under contracts, um, we like three of them. We have three of them have been canceled. Okay. Okay. So um, we have eight on the list in front of us. Uh, do you want to just contract? There's there's two changes. Okay. Uh, there's eight contracts on the list. Uh, the third one up from the bottom that says Northeast Foundation for Children. Okay. Um, we had incomplete information come back to us, okay. so therefore you do not, you will not be seeing that contract tonight, so I have pulled that from the list due to incomplete uh, information. And the, uh, the second one from the bottom, the Clark HVAC Services, the initial amount was $25,575. Uh, when you receive this, Central Services uh, was unable at that time to give the proper split between the city portion of the HVAC and the school portion. The school portion um, is $16,075, and the, the balance is the, the city. So those are the only two changes. One contract being pulled and a chain. So I'll read through them again. Um, the Clark HVAC. You just need to tell me that total because I'm not that good a mathematician. Um, so the, the contracts that are before us are the Neptur Benson contract uh, for $7,551.50. Uh, this is for related to the JFK pool. Uh, G Housing contract for $25,000. Uh, this is bottled water and juice products. Um, LV, uh, LPVEC, uh, $24,000. Medicaid municipal reimbursement, um, uh, Chandra 
Phi, uh, ten thousand uh, dollars student translations for Khmer, a uh, Cambodian, um, the Collaborative for Educational Services, uh, two thousand eight hundred eighty dollars. Um, uh, and skipping down, Century Consultants, $22,236, and then the Clark HVAC Services contract, which you just described. For $16,075. Okay. So those are all of the contracts, field trips, and minutes under the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, motion to approve as presented. And okay. seconded. Okay. Ms. Minnick. <laughs> Could you please talk to me about Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative Medicaid Municipal? We should remove that from the consent agenda then uh, and pull it from the consent agenda so that we can vote on the consent agenda. Then we can take it. So if you'd like to move to okay. remove that from the consent agenda. Yes, I move that. Okay. We, I just have a question about it. Okay. I have a question on the $25,000 for the water and the okay. juice. Okay. So we'll remove that from the consent agenda. So then we'll, the consent agenda, oh. I move that we remove the Hazers classroom field trip from the consent agenda. I have a question on that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. but I'd like to remove the minutes of the last September 13th meeting from the consent agenda. Okay. Is, uh, is there anything left of the consent agenda? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So um, with those items removed, and we'll pull them out for, for discussion at the regular meeting. Um, uh, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda as amended say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. And just for those watching at home, the purpose of the consent agenda is that all of these items are to be sort of researched and vetted beforehand that we can take a single vote on them. But obviously there's some still remaining questions. So, uh, so the consent agenda passes. Why don't we then um, move a little bit of out of order and then take up each of the individual items. Um, so the first item, why don't we take up the contracts, uh, the bottled water contract, bottled and juice contract for $25,000. Um, you had a question about I that. I do have a question for it. Um, somewhere I recall going back with bottled water and the plastic and trying to keep it out of our schools and trying to keep it for the green issue. And I just been wondering about $25,000 for bottled water. And then the juice, I mean, are we reimbursed for that? And what's the cafeteria program? I mean, that just seems like a lot. The contract uh, with G. Housen is a combination contract uh, for Smith Vocational, their culinary program, Smith Vocational, their cafeteria program, and our cafeteria program at Northampton Public Schools. Uh, we capped a contract at 25000 for water and juices uh, as we see fit as they meet the needs within the program. So this is very similar to what we have done in the past. Uh, we share this contract with them. We both order off of it. We're not committed to the 25000 We could order 5000 if that's all we wanted to do. But why are we buying water? I mean... Why not push for water bottles and fill it up out in the hall? And I mean, why would the city put a lot of money into our water plants? As far as I'm concerned, and uh, I I, was wondering I can't answer that question. Water. I don't know. Uh, they they buy bottled water. They, the the students uh, take the bottled water. They drink the bottled water. Or they you know they take water from home. But I understand that. I just thought at some point I, I was it here or might it have been because I watched the meetings. It was it the city council meeting that discussed dollar, bottled yeah. water and it getting it's, it's, been, it's come up year after year here. Um, it's uh, I mean, Lee Severn is letting you and those up every year I think and um, it's just one of those it's, it's been here. I mean, we've, we've talked about it. We've, we've lots, of, lots of us have advocated getting rid of it. Or, and, and we never did. Program. I thought that we, we did to some point. Soda. But I thought we got we were getting rid of the, the bottled water because of also because of the green effect of the having no plastic and you can get water right out there. Twenty five twenty five thousand dollars when you have a tight budget, that could be the could yeah, be but a I, person. I, my guess is they're buying it for seventeen cents a bottle wholesale and selling it to the students for more. So it's so we're gonna be making I, I assume so, yeah. I mean this would be part of those programs, yes. So we're gonna be making a profit off of this? Yes. I can't tell you by product line or by the individual item. But it goes into the food program. We get reimbursement for what we buy. This is one of the expenses that's part of the food service overall program. So exclusive of the juices, let's just say um, 
it is 17 cents a bottle, it's 20 cents a bottle, and that's five, I mean, are we selling it for like a dollar a bottle or something? Are we making five times profit? Is this a profit? Or is it just like I, selling water? I can't tell you what the profit is because uh, I don't have that information in front of me or the, the, the amount of volume that makes up the 25000 They have this um, in order for us to buy from them. And we know based on past experience, um, the volume that we have purchased, they have looked at collectively uh, what's been consumed and what we've needed in the past. And this is how they've come up with this contract amount. Okay, and another question, are these going into like the um Vending machines at the high school, and also, or is it just? just I can't tell you how they split them up once they receive the product. I can't tell you where they're being put. All I know is they're being sold within the school, but I can't tell you what's being put, what size, or uh, what quantity is being put into machines, or what's being sold right there in the food service line. I I don't have that. Okay, but we are splitting it with Smith Folk and. JFK and the high school? No, the culinary program at Smith Vocational, because okay, so their program, it, their culinary piece of this is totally different and run independently than their cafeteria program, just like our cafeteria program. Okay. Okay. The other contract was the collaborative contract that you had a question about. Correct. Uh, does the Medicaid reimbursement come to the school department or does it go to the city? Medicaid, uh, this this twenty four thousand. This twenty four thousand is the fee we pay to the collaborative for to the their to collect it. And I want to know it. where the money they collect goes. I think it goes to the city. We we get. Uh, and I don't know if the city gets it to us. That's what I'm asking. I think. Well, we have a Medicaid account that we we use and we charge expenses off to, that comes back to us. It does come back. Yes. Because if you look, if you looked in the, um, the budget package, I believe there was, uh, um, I'm thinking up close to $250,000, $275,000 in the Medicaid account. And this is a contract for their services to apply for that. It was, it was previously done by Logan for Educational Services, formerly HEC. Okay. Um, a long time ago. And before that, the district did it itself. My understanding was at some point in time when they were applying for the reimbursements that they came back into the city and I was just asking if those reimbursements then get to the school department. Okay. We have an account or if they for stay that. in the city coffers, do you, that's, if, do you follow what I'm saying? It's sort of like charter school stuff, you know, and some of the other things on the No, it doesn't, it doesn't reside. We have a separate account for that as one of our funds. Like we have Choice, we have Medicaid, we have grants. Those are part of the monies. So we do get it. We that's do get that. Thank you. Uh, okay. So was there any other contracts? I couldn't remember the other two. There was two contracts. Okay, so those are that, So then there was a question about nature's classroom. It's just a, a process issue. We're given these documents to inspect, I suppose, to evaluate and make a decision. But I'm looking at the nature's classroom. The second page says, any student with life-threatening food allergies, yes, is clearly checked. I think I can see EpiPen, but I can't make out anymore, and I certainly wouldn't want to go into court with me pretending to make out EpiPen. Um, the same thing with any students with special, any students with health, health issues, yes, and the line is completely legible. So again, I don't, I don't doubt that the school personnel are going to take proper action to ensure that student with the life-threatening food allergy is safe, but if I'm going to vote to approve this form, I'd just like to be clear. Do you know what the uh, procedure is so the, the field trip gets uh, sent to the superintendent eventually for his uh, approval to bring to us for, mm -hmm. for us to vote on? But does a copy go to like to the school nurse and does she pull up the file? Yes, and she's <laughs> involved in all of this. Right. And they go over the health issues of each student that's going to provide the proper medical support for the students while they're there. That's our responsibility. I'm not, I'm not doubting that that's happening. It's just it seems, it seems nonsensical 
to present me with this so I can't read it. So I just want to make, you know, for future reference, if we could just make sure that if we're going to be copied on all these, that they're legible. Yeah. It appears that the online version is a little bit less legible than the hard right. copy. Yeah, yeah, that, it's, it's harder to read. Yeah, yeah that's a, it's a minor issue just for, it's just a process issue. That, okay. Were there other, was there another field trip question? Okay. So then the final issue question was about the minutes. Yes. Um, this is the minutes of uh, Thursday, September 13th, 2012. Um, item number 3B. I'd like to uh, amend it. Um, that I said that it allows parents who are on the school committee to advocate for their kids and that anybody in that situation has to do two things. They have to follow the same procedures as every other parent who advocates for their kids and that they, as because you're on the school committee, you have to file um, notice at the city clerk's office of the times and people with whom you've advocated. Because it currently just sort of reads as though it's something that I have to do. It's something that everybody, actually everybody who works for the schools, everybody who works for the city has to do. Um, if they advocate for their children within the schools and they're in any position of authority over any of the people with whom they're advocating. So could you suggest, is there some slight yeah. amendment that you could Well, it's do? really just to kind of replace that with, it allows parents who are on the school committee, as an insert what's there, to advocate for their kids, and um, and allows any, and, and requires any other parent in that situation to follow the same procedures as every other parent and to uh, file a notice at the city clerk's office, which is what it says there. So there's a motion to amend the minutes of September 13th. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion of those amendments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, so then... Um, Can I make a motion to vote on all four things? Yes. So, the, um, so I move that we approve the amended minutes of September 13th, that we approve the... Um, field trip to um, Major's classroom from lead school, and then the two contracts, one for um, collaborative and the other was for the bottled water. I'd like to leave the bottled water out. So you'd like to take a no, separate? separate. I'd still like to, to okay. keep that separate. So I can take that and just okay. move the approval of the other three. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. So um, all those in favor of approving those items, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So then finally, I would entertain a motion on the $25,000 contract for bottled water and juices. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion on that. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Nay. <laughs> Any abstentions? Okay. So uh, that that is also adopted. Okay. Um, so we'll now return to the um, regular agenda. Um, the first item is under reports and recommendations. We have an update on the corrective action plan under special education and we'll recognize uh, Lori F uh, Farkas. She is also giving the report on special education. That's correct. Yeah. I was actually unaware of the update on the corrective action plan and I apologize for that. I can report on that at the next Next month. Okay. So, just, so then just a report on special education. Yes. Thought I could see it without my glasses. Maybe not. Um, so I have been in the district for about seven weeks at this point. And um, I just wanted to share some of my first impressions around the strengths and um, the areas that I see that are in need of growth. Um, both special education, the education of English language learners, and um, those, those two main areas. Oh, and early childhood. Um, in special education, I'm really thrilled to find all the variety of programs in the dis that are within the district that serve to keep students with more significant or very specialized group of special needs 
in our schools, and that's an incredibly important thing from my perspective. Um, in addition, we have a lot of great, strong faculty in the special education department and a very active and involved group of parents which um, offer a lot of feedback and support to the programs. And I think Northampton is unique and fortunate in that way because not all districts have involved and supportive parents. The areas, and there's one theme throughout all of my um, discussion and all of my findings in terms of areas of growth, and that is to um, have a greater sense of what the big picture is in terms of both our um, staffing picture and our uh, fiscal sense of fiscal responsibility. Because once we have that, we can serve all children within the district more effectively. Um, in addition, I, I look forward to in the next year more co clearly defining our internal programs both in terms of how students can access those, access pieces of those, and how they move back into a more integrated setting. Um, in addition, uh, I'm looking forward to a lot of staff training with faculty, with all faculty, and special education faculty in particular, around all of those issues. But more so, I'm excited to work with um, regular education faculty, mainstream faculty, however you want to refer to that. So all staff know how to work best with students with a variety of learning needs and approaches to learning, um, as well as how to monitor the progress of those students. In terms of English language learners, um, we, have, we are so fortunate in New England to have a really varied cultural makeup of our schools. And um, coming from other districts where they're not as fortunate to have that, um, I see that really celebrated in our schools in many ways. Our teachers also have a strong commitment from my impressions to co include families who come to the, to the area or um, to this country as, as new, um, um, new residents and to include their cultures, um, make sure they understand our approaches to education, how our systems work. Again, the area of needed growth that I see is how, holding the big picture, understanding where our needs are, understanding how to meet those needs in um, a way that serves students well and is also fiscally responsible. Um, in addition, we have a whole new set of regulations, curriculum, and, um, and training pieces for faculty or for all educators that we um, will be working on and, and accessing and training um, all the staff in the district. In early childhood, our, my last major area of responsibility, um, we have one a major great strength, and um, not to name a particular person, but Barbara Black is respected in, at, at a, an incredible level throughout the state, actually. Um, having done early childhood education in my last two districts, um, her name is, I mean, she sits with great respect um, from all early childhood educators and at meetings that are statewide. So I, I just wanted to recognize that we are so fortunate to have her here. Um, and again, I look forward to how, getting a sense of the big picture and how we can serve some very involved children in, in the best way possible so they get the best advantage early on, which we know research um, really sets children up to be included in the long run. Um, just seeing if I forgot anything. So um, my next steps are really twofold in terms of my own professional goals in the district. Um, one is to focus on the, and it's shared with one of our district improvement goals, is to focus on the inclusion of fifth and sixth graders in math. 
instruction and to um, work with special educators, um, regular ed teachers in uh, figuring out how we can do that through co-teaching or um, the whatever variety of ways that we figure that out. And um, I share that goal with, um, with Brian and I will also be sharing that goal with um, the principals at JFK, Ryan Road, and Jackson Street. Um, my other goal, my other administrative goal, goes back to the, my, my main theme around looking at our management and operations, essentially, and um, our procedures, our routines, our systems, we're putting systems in place where they ha they aren't currently. Um, maintaining a sense of fiscal responsibility to all the students in the district, and um, as well as responsibility to laws and policies, which special education and early childhood and uh, English language learners are not short of. And um, then making sure that our staff are continually involved in training and their own professional development so we can keep recruit the highest um, standard of faculty. And again, I apologize for not having an update on the, um, on the uh, our, our uh, I'm sorry. Corrective yeah. action plan. Our corrective action plan, but I will have that to you. Are there any questions? Or? Ms. Pick and Mr. Flynn. Thank you. Um, just a short sure. question. You said that in the, um, the focus on the inclusion of fifth and sixth graders in that, and you've targeted two of the elementary schools. Why, why those two, not all four? I just asked which elementary principals wanted to join with me in that um, in that SMART goal. It's it's part of the new evaluation of administrators, and so I'm. To not take on a, a huge um, scope, I'm trying to be successful with a few areas of focus. So we're just being, I asked yeah. for volunteers. <laughs> Mr. Yeah, Flynn. Sure, one of the, last month I had given the program, I need to discuss that back, and one of the things that had come up as a concern was um, the, like the, I guess, communication and uh, Days for phone calls and not sure. And you mentioned about putting routines and procedures in place. Is that an effort to address some of these concerns so that we'll have a smoother operation to get better training and information and tighten up procedures? Yes, I've already met with the PAC once. We have a monthly meeting set up. We have um, an initial parent rights meeting set up as well as a meet and greet. Um, we uh, we had a really good start, and I'll be handing out next week when I meet with them a, um, a form that Barbara Black actually made up for early childhood families and families of, um, of English language learners, um, kind of the special education um, communication lines as well as um, terms just explained in a, in a more straightforward manner. Um, and also I've talked a lot in, I've met with all staff once and I'm on my second round of working with staff. And I've talked a lot about our responsibility to families in terms of communication and our relationships. Thank you. Sure. Are there other questions or comments? Mr. Ball? Mm -hmm. I have a question um, back um, what was Ms. Payne was talking about um, the inclusion of fifth and sixth grade with math restriction and JFK. How is that, how, how do you plan that working? I mean, is it the fifth graders within each building and the sixth graders? And Because we just did presented a, um, a comprehensive math program, so I'm just wondering how that all works, you know, like drawn out on paper. My daughter's a fifth grader at Ryan Road School, so I'm wondering, is that going to affect her this year? Does it go into effect next year? Well, we already include the vast majority of fifth and sixth graders in a regular ed classroom for all four learning. And, um, and so what we're working on is looking at how to train um, both regular ed and special ed teachers how to do co-teaching co um, when students would be typically be pulled out. So it won't affect or change the vast majority of what students experience now. But it may add in 
um, two teachers into the classroom, which would give students, some students, um, alternative ways to approach a particular concept or topic or practice um, from two different perspectives and uh, from one person who is trained in working with students that have a variety of needs. So again, it's seven weeks I've been here. <laughs> and, um, and this is something I'll be working towards throughout the year. And I'll just add to that. The goal is to have more students in the regular education classroom. And when we add students with special needs into the regular ed classroom, we want to offer more support for them while they're in there. So that's is that going goal. to be in the, the uh, of somebody who's trained in oh, one of the, that's the, part of the goal. department then? Right. Professional okay, so. development for the teachers so that we can have this be a successful co-teaching model in fifth and sixth grade, okay. which is also on our district improvement plan. So it doesn't have to do with the two fifth graders at Ryan Road having to do anything of co-teaching together. It's actually oh, somebody right. who's no. coming in. Okay. Special right. ed and right. Well, right. the reason I'm asking is because my daughter oh, came a good home question. and asked about that. It's she a said, very good question. you know, we should be, somebody had discussed about talking about the two teachers co-teaching mm. and changing classes, and I hadn't really heard about that, and I was wondering if this had anything to do with that. That's, that's a different <coughs> model that I could talk with you okay. about at another time. Thank you very much. Sure. Ms. Minnick? I was going to uh, just say congratulations on surviving the seven weeks so far. <laughs> I know I know it's jumping in with both feet and, and so um, I was just going to mention that I am the Northampton representative to the board at the Collaborative for Educational Services here in Northampton and they have an excellent center for English language education and I hope that if you ever get to a place where you need assistance that you will look toward the collaborative for that. I've worked with Debbie a lot. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. The next um, item is an update. Uh, this is on the NEASC and AP results, and this is uh, from Chris Brennan. Mr. Brennan. I start with the AP results first. I thought what I would do is give you a little bit of a historical uh, context for all the data that I think we have a fast run through some statistics and I'll hand out some sheets with more statistics at the end. But, uh, just a little historical background. Uh, when I started teaching AP English at the high school in 1988, there were 254 students in the senior class, and we had one AP Lit class with 22 students in it that represented 8% of the total of the class. This year, we are 213 in the senior class. We're offering four sections of AP Lit. We have 109 students, which represents 51% of the class. I think you can see that our move away from exclusivity to inclusivity, our, way from, our move from elitism to egalitarianism, <laughs> and adopting the concept that if you open the door, invite them in, and encourage them, they will drop. And I think it's proven in the statistics that I'm about to show you. Uh, last year, in the 2011-2012 year, 63% of our upperclassmen, juniors and seniors, were enrolled in an AP class. That is number eight in the state for a percentage of upperclassmen. This year, we added 5% onto that. This year, we have 308 students who will take a total of 591 exams, and it represents 68% of our upperclassmen. That's a one-year growth of 5%. I don't know if we can keep doing this. Um, since 2008, we've increased the number of students taking AP courses, that's students now, not exams, from 190 to 308. That's a 282% increase. Um, last year, 81% of the students who took an AP class, that's all courses, not just math, science and English, 
um, I just want to make sure you, uh, 81 percent of all of the students who took an AP course earned a qualifying score. A qualifying score is a three, four, or five, which is we'll get the students uh, credit in uh, many colleges and universities. Just for a comparative statistic, in Massachusetts, 74 percent of students who took exams got a qualifying score, and globally, only 61 percent students who took AP exams scored a qualifying score. Um, last year, 78 percent of the students earned a qualifying score of three or greater on AP exams in math, science, and English. And I mentioned that because the MIMSI grant that we're part of, they only fund us and provide um, professional development in math, the math, science, and English areas. So I think it's worth sort of calling that statistic out. Um, last year, 78% of students earned a qualifying score of three or greater on 400 and AP, 408 AP exams in math, science, and English. In 2008, 177 earned a three or better. So we've had a 131% increase in five years. That's since we joined uh, the music grant. Uh, the next thing I'd give you is uh, just a, a few um, statistics about qualifying scores and how we rank in the state with other um, public and private high schools. Um, in, in English language and composition, that's our junior AP course, we are second in the state for qualifying scores. Last year, Sue Crago, the teacher of all four sections of that class, was named a Massachusetts uh, Teacher of the Year for, for uh, the Science Initiative sponsored through MIMSI. She got a free trip to uh, Washington, D.C. and uh, met our representatives and uh, senators. In English Literature and Composition, um, our senior class were number three in the state of Massachusetts. Um, in, as I told you before, in 1988, we offered one section. Now we've got uh, four sections. and. Uh, this year we are running four sections. Again, 51% of the senior class will participate. We're number three in the state. English combined, if you take the English language and the English lit courses, we actually come out number two in the, in, in the state. Only second to uh, the Boston Latin High School, which has a population of close to 1,700 students. We have about 950. So I think that's something to be uh, proud of. Uh, in the science courses, we're number seven in the state in chemistry. Uh, Sue Biggs, the chemistry AP teacher, also received the Massachusetts um, award, and she too uh, went along with Sue Biggs, with Sue uh, Crago, and they went to Washington, D.C., and uh, met uh, peers from all around the country who were equally um, valued in their states. Another great statistic about, about uh, Sue Biggs. Our environmental science scores are number three in the state. We don't even teach the course. She teaches it as an add-on to her chemistry class at the end of the semester. Just prepares them for the test in a period of about three weeks, and we had the third highest qualifying scores in the state. Physics, number four. AP um, science combined, number seven in the state. So um, it's, it's just a... It's a fantastic program, and I think what we should be proudest of are the statistics that I'm going to give you next, because I think these say something about the inclusivity and the egalitarian nature of our, of our program. Um, and I'd also like to, to make a point of saying that um, I think the district deserves credit for this. I mean, it's great that you know, I teach a class and I get to get to teach some of the best and the brightest and these kids who are highly motivated and work really hard come to Saturday sessions. Many of them give up nine Saturdays over a school year to come to Saturday sessions. But it's the whole district that is teaching these kids. They come to me well prepared. Uh, they got a great foundation. We shouldn't get all the credit for those of us who teach the uh, classes. I think all the teachers should uh, should be uh, praised. Now here's the here's the the, uh, the numbers that I especially like. In 2008, we had four students who were low income qualifying. That means you know, they were receiving a free or reduced lunch and they uh, got their, their exams for free from the College Board. Uh, in uh, 2012, we had 29. <laughs> 
which is a 625% increase in the total number of our low income students taking and receiving qualifying scores. Actually, more students took the exams, but the qualifying scores never stand up. African American and Hispanic students with qualifying scores, math, science, and English. In 2008, we had three. Uh, last year, we had 10. That's a 233% increase. Actually, 2010 was a better year. We had 13. I don't know what happened to those three. Uh, kids, but I think that the two, over 200% increase is still great. And then the final uh, stat that I think is very telling about the quality of our science program at the high school is uh, females earning qualifying scores in math and science courses. In 2008, 18 young women scored a qualifying score in a math or a science course. Last year, 79 scored qualifying scores. That's a 339% increase in the young women taking math and science courses, courses that 20 years ago were dominated by young men. And I think it, it speaks a great deal about the quality of, of that program and those teachers who really encouraged uh, our young men to take math and science classes. Um, just as a point of interest for you, I know you probably, most of you read the Gazette article, but I would also encourage you to read last Saturday's Sunday Globe magazine. There's an article in here called The AP Trap, and it talks a little bit about AP overload. This trend is happening all over the state. Uh, we're the only school from Western Massachusetts that's mentioned in here, and it's not in a negative way at all, but the, the article does raise some concerns about kids perhaps overfilling their schedules with AP courses at the expense sometimes of art, music, and some important classes that we think high school students should graduate from high school with. So that's my AP numbers. And I'll, and I'll pass around a, the rest of the data. It's, it's too much to go through now, but I'll be glad to pass it around. Mrs. Minnick. I just want to comment. You said that this wasn't just the AP teachers that deserved the credit, but rather all of the faculty in the in the district that prepared them. But I do want to say that I can. I, I don't think that you're taking the test for the kids, and I don't think that you're solely responsible for this. But I do remember a few years back when you came to the school committee and suggested that we needed to enhance the rigor of our high school curriculum and so I think you and a few of your colleagues were instrumental in moving us where we are so thank you yeah, that was for that. Long, that was quite a few years ago <laughs> I don't recognize <laughs> a lot of you. faces here but yeah this is my second go round as assistant principal and I think I did it did it back then but um, it clearly you know, it shows that if you if you really encourage kids, well, yeah, I mean, I think we rather than yeah. saying you know only the best, only the brightest, only the upper middle class, only you know people of a certain demographic take these classes. I mean, we've proven that that's not true. I think it's very true that people perform at the level that's expected of them, and you introduced us to the concept that we had some kids that could do it if we invited them and expected them. The thing that's interesting about our, our joining of the grant also is in 2008, this program was already pretty robust. I mean, to start off with 179 kids taking AP courses, I think the, one of the reasons the Mimsy wanted us is that we, we sort of brought some pretty good stats with us to begin with, and I don't think they ever expected that it would compound on itself the way it has, and I, I think um, we should be proud of our kids and proud of our staff. Yep. Are these um, numbers, you, you went through the list of what we're second in the state and seventh and all that. Is that something you're going to hand out to us? Oh, yeah, I have all the, okay, uh, that. Okay, great. And I have a lot. I mean, there's a lot of data that you can call from well, the uh, college board site and uh, the site, but I, I do have a handout. I didn't, okay, I great. didn't get it together fast enough to have it in your packets, but okay. I'd love to share it. Mr. Moore. I just have a, I'm curious to find out about the Common Core and AP classes. I know the, we're required to teach, maybe all of our classes have to sort of conform to the Common Core, make sure they touch on the things that are there. Is, that, is this another issue in terms of alignment because it's a different sort of test and everything else? Yeah. Well, I think, I think students who are taking AP courses are going to be 
very qualified to take any sort of park exam at the end of uh, you know, what will replace the, the end of pass test. Uh, these, these are kids who are challenged every day. I mean, we teach these classes as though they are a freshman or sophomore or college course. And many kids come back to report to us that the courses that they took at Northampton High School are in fact more difficult in many cases than the courses they take at uh, local colleges, including Smith College. Uh, they come back and say they're bigger and what is expected of them is at least that high. So I don't foresee any problem uh, integrating this one. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Mr. Zahowski. Thank you. I, I know that the MIMSI grant is kind of coming to an end. Is that, that correct? Yes. And so um, you stated all these, these great statistics, and uh, now with some of the grant being pulled away, is there a plan in place to kind of keep things moving forward? Because you were really you know, excited about the 5% increase as all of us are and so we like to think that that could continue even though some of the support well you know one of the proven ways of uh, supporting the pro I mean, one of the great things that the MIMSI grant has supplied us with is just excellent professional and I think you'll hear when I start going through the DASC uh, recommendations one of the major recommendations that keeps coming out in their document is the pro providing staff with professional development um, next week, I'm going to a two-day, we're, we're required to go to two out of three years. We're supposed to go to these two days, and I also did an, a summer week-long uh, professional development at the college. And those are the type of things that, personally, I'm worried we're not going to see. Um, I don't know if the district is going to be able to come up with the funds and the, and the, the wherewithal to send. All these teachers to ongoing professional development. Oh, well, because I certainly like to go back. I'm still teaching a couple of those classes. Uh, I find the, the the professional development much more valuable than most of the professional development I've received over the last 30 years. Mr. Duvall? Well, I just wanted to say that, say that um, I know when I went to high school, most of my math and science teachers were men. Um, and I think now that we have a lot more women, I think that there's also the, the modeling, which just really comes with that, too, on top of the excellence that they're the, the, you know, going to be provided into providing to the students. That's why I think it's Right, and I, and I think um, the, I think it's a good model for both the young women and for the guys, for them to see, uh, you know, a strong, in teaching, you know, a chemistry class or our physics, our physics class, it's a fantastic model for these kids. I know a Harvard president lost his job over some of the comments he made about uh, math and science, and, and, uh, and I think that our kids are getting the exact opposite uh, message at our school. Any other questions? I think I'd like to answer the question about the asked. I think it's important. You asked a really good question. How do we keep this going? And there's two important uh, points of concentration to keep this going. The first, uh, as Chris mentioned, is the professional development, the commitment to professional development, which you can really thrive on. They love the opportunity to learn more, to be challenged, and to become better at their profession. So we have to keep those opportunities available for teachers, because that's a real perk for teachers. Obviously, it's a great benefit for us. We want to make sure that we can keep it going. And the second is that obviously we have very, very talented teachers in this district. We have to work to keep them here. We have talented teachers with a wealth of professional development behind them. They become very attractive candidates for the district. And I think it's important for us to have a vision going forward of how we keep our very best teachers here in the And so that will be part of our budget discussion. Probably wouldn't be that difficult to replace me as an English teacher, but try to find an AP physics teacher uh, in the state of Massachusetts. I think a couple of years ago, I remember there were only five certified teachers in physics graduating in any one year in the state. So it's you know they're they're really 
hunted for. I think they've got headhunters uh, <laughs> trying to steal them away from districts. So. I just have a question. Do you know the um, percentage of Hispanics and Blacks that we have? Um, the three percent increase to a ten percent increase. I just wonder. This out of how many? Actually, in the bill, you mean the, the total percentage? I don't have that those numbers with me. Uh, I could get them for you. Of the demographics. Yeah, I don't have one on top. Okay. This is you know, welcome these welcoming these students into these classes. I think um, that's where your that's where your teachers who recognize you know a special spark in a kid, or see a, a test a PSAT test for instance, and say you know that there's a, there's some data here that says you could do well in one of these classes and that's that's how we use data to sometimes identify those who might otherwise fly under the radar and if they're willing to take a chance. Okay. Okay. Thank and the ASC? Yes. yes. Right. Um, what I thought I would do is just give you a little overview of where we are in the process right now. Um, you know that we had our visit in the spring. Uh, the reaccreditation team was here. Um, in, what you have in your packets is an outline of the commendations and the recommendations that arrived. And they don't have it in their packet. No. Oh, Kim said that uh, they were sent and just copied <laughs> and she even uh, uh, I'm uh, sorry. I think you had it in your data packet. Huh? Sorry, I haven't seen it. She even got an email back that the copies were all made. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> just well, continue. I'll, just, yeah. I'll, I'll bring it and uh, I'll get <laughs> the, uh, the documents to you. It's okay. Yeah. So anyway, where we are in the in the process is that we have received the initial report from a NEASC, and what you will have uh, delivered to you is a, a packet that'll be an outline of the commendations and recommendations that are included, and they're they're divided. Um, the report is divided by the standards, and they're the same standards that we had a committee for each of the uh, seven standards as we went through the process of self-study last year. Uh, and there are recommendations and combinations for all of it. So I think it's important to realize that most of the recommendations that are in here, uh, that you'll see that I'll mention a couple of them, uh, were developed uh, directly from self-study teachers and the staff at the school did along with the administration. These are things that we rep uh, recognized in our own building, both our strengths and where we needed to work. Um, what will happen next is that around Thanksgiving, you'll receive an official letter of notification of our uh, our standard, our status of accreditation. There's essentially three different statuses. Uh, the first is accreditation uh, that just requires a two-year progress report and then a five-year progress report after that. The second standard is an accreditation with a two-year progress report and some special reports and actions that they may ask us to perform. And then thirdly, there's accreditation where you are placed on warning with the one all of the above, um, the two-year plan, some special plans, and some special um, highlighted uh, recommendations and actions that we're required to uh, perform. What we have to do for the rest of this year is to reform um, a follow-up committee that will probably be made up of the uh, uh, folks, from the chairs of the various standards committee. Um, they will prioritize the recommendations that we've been given. After that, um, after we receive the letter in November, we may have to uh, reprioritize some of those things based on what the NEASC people tell us. They may say, you've got to do these things right away, and we'll have to reprioritize. And then by the end of the year, the uh, follow-up committees have to submit status reports to uh, the principal, who then um, passes them along to uh, the superintendent. Um, I don't know. Should I just mention a couple? Of the if you would, give us a few okay. highlights. I, I, what, what I what I what I'll do is um, what I'd like to do is point out a number of what I, I call you're doing a good job, but uh, <laughs> pairings of some of the 
accommodations and recommendations. I can do one for each of the five standards, and I'll show you what I mean. For instance, in the, in the first standard, that's our core values and belief and learning expectation standards, the commendation says the school's core values and beliefs in 21st century learning expectations are actively reflected in the culture of the school, period. But the first but in the first recommendation it says we need a plan to ensure familiarity with all aspects of the core values and beliefs and learning expectations throughout the community with emphasis on application of school-wide rubrics. So what they're basically saying is we need to further integrate this document that we've created with core values, et cetera, into every aspect of the curriculum, um, you know, our planning, everything. So it has to be fully integrated. You're doing a good job, but it needs to be fully integrated. In the second um, standard for curriculum, there's a nice commendation that we have availability of computer labs for class use. But we need to develop a, and fund a three-year strategic plan for technology, including school-wide internet installation, upgrade of all hardware, acquisition of mobile technology, formalization of, for outside de uh, device use, et cetera. Um, just as a sidelight sort of, um, well, evidence of this, when the Mimsy people sent me a PowerPoint of all of our fantastic uh, AP results and statistics, I couldn't open it in the building because we don't have an, uh, a PowerPoint uh, that can do that in the building. They're two, two, I don't know, um, generations. two generations old, and it crashes the computers when you try to open them up. So I mean, that's what they're talking about. You've got the stuff, but everything needs to be upgraded and uh, under instruction. They said, we you know, we have informal collegial professional discourse about practice, uh, but it happens informally. It's a, con it's a commendation. But what you need to do is provide teachers with formal professional development opportunities uh, and give them the opportunity to re reflect and share their beliefs about work. So take an informal thing that happens haphazardly in the teacher's room during lunch and give us some time to do it in professional development opportunities. Uh, assessment for student learning. Um, we get commended for our proactive use of data uh, to begin identifying gaps in ninth grade student achievement. This is something that I worked on last year. Um, right after the first progress reports came out, I got a list of all the D's and F's, compared that to how the kids did at JFK, both on MCAS tests and what their final report cards looked at JFK. We formed a group of teachers, it was amazing. All the ninth grade teachers showed up after school for voluntary meetings to talk about these kids and to start to develop plans. Because our theory is get these kids when they're freshmen, when they're starting to have problems, and you're gonna solve a lot more problems along the, before we, they, the problems get bigger and the kids are missing credits, et cetera. So we, they, we use the data, but um, we need to implement a formal process to gather data. Uh, from both current students, post-secondary institutions to inform our revision of curriculum, instruction, and assessment. So keep doing it, you need to, but you need to do it more. Move it from an informal system to a formal system. And then the final one I'll mention has to do with uh, heterogeneous grouping. They commended us for heterogeneous grouping of some core courses over a student's high school career, but under recommendations, they said we need to increase the development of more heterogeneous classes across all disciplines and include professional development to support the successful implementation of these. Because as, if you know, when you, when you make courses more heterogeneous, it involves teaching, you've got to teach teachers about uh, modifying, making accommodations, um, you know, different learning styles, uh, how to uh, layer curriculum differently, et cetera. So I think, the, you know, the, the reports are, it, it mirrors what we found, and I think it's a good document, and I think we have still a lot of work to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. the report.
Okay, the next item on the agenda is um, the superintendent uh, discussing, uh, oh, excuse me, I, my, my mistake, um, the director of technology's report, and I'd recognize uh, Angelo Rota. Angelo Rota, I'm sorry. A, an interesting set of remarks from <laughs> Brennan, especially with respect to technology. Uh, and no criticism of you, Mr. Rota. No, I, it, you know, as a tech person and an educator, uh, that's always a huge question, and uh, I'll speak about that somewhat at length as I proceed. But I. Uh, when people think about technology, they just say, oh, there's a lot of technology in the school committee because they all have laptops in front of them. There's a lot of technology there. And technology just isn't the hardware. The technology is how you use the hardware and how the instruction is enhanced because of the hardware. And so that's a challenge to me is the technology uh, person for the district, the chief tech person for the district, because how do I work with teachers to continue to improve the great job they're already doing with AP and that group of students? And how do I also make technology available to those students who are struggling in order to raise their performance as well? So it's working with technology and a great part of working with technology is professional development and how we help teachers to teach in more creative ways using technology we have. What I'm seeing being new in the district as well is a great readiness on the part of staff for technology. They're very excited about technology. They know technology exists. Uh, it's how to get the technology to them with what we have now that they can use in their classrooms. Uh, here's if I go back five years and I think of when I wanted to bring technology to teachers, people weren't familiar with things as they are now. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of these resources now which are so common in the outside world, outside of education, people already know about. The challenge now is how do we give it meaning and enhance instruction by using these tools? It isn't just those facets of the technology, it's being able to use them. We have a number of new staff, and I'm excited about the new staff that we have in the district. We have now a data coordinator, Cynthia Kelly, who's been at the JFK Middle School for a number of years, is moved to take the position of data coordinator. She'll be working with our SIMS data, EPIMS, SCS, getting MCAS data out, working with principals and staff to increase our use of data across the district. So I'm very excited to have her on the tech team. We hired a new elementary technology integration specialist, Andrea Marks. Andrea Marks is a graduate of Columbia. She worked at the Poly Prep Country Day School and the Ethical Culture Fieldston School in New York City. She's great with technology. Uh, her philosophy aligns with my philosophy, which is technology is a tool. It's to be used to enhance instruction, and she'll be working closely with all the elementary uh, school staff to achieve that goal. We have recently hired a half-time high school technology integration specialist, Gabriel Richard Harrington. Uh, she's been working as a consultant. She also works with school districts. She's part of MassQ, very knowledgeable in the area of technology integration, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot of new things with her at the high school level. I can interrupt just a moment, but I just want to clarify that um, these are three new people, not three new positions, replacing people that were in current positions. Thanks. Uh, our current conditions. Our network is fair. That's how I would classify it. And as you heard from Mr. Brennan's remarks of NEASC, they say, yes, you have this equipment, but it is outdated. It does need to be revamped. 
Uh, we are working using the budget that we currently have to target uh, a number of areas. We have a number of old desktop computers. We're purchasing 30 new desktop computers, which will replace the eldest ones that we have in service. A number of them are in JFK. They will be replaced in the next month or so. Um, we've also instituted a help desk. There hasn't been a help desk up to this point. We've formally instituted a help desk where we have staff in each building reporting needs to a central a, a person in the main office of that building, and then they forward that to the help desk. We create help desk tickets so that we can see where the areas of help are most common. We can answer them within 48 to 72 hours maximum. We can prioritize. We can see. We can group by building. So we can send one person to one building and they can accomplish all those tasks at once. So it's much more organized. And it also helps us for professional development because if we see there are simple issues that actually we can train folks to be able to solve on their own, then that'll save us for more important things. So the help desk has been a great thing and it's really working out very well. Uh, the use of technology by the staff is phenomenal. Uh, Mr. Brennan mentioned Sue Biggs as one. She's phenomenal with the technology that she uses. A number of our teachers bring their own devices. That is a concern to me as a, a network person as well because I worry about viruses not only to protect us, but also to protect them. And even though a lot of folks use Macintosh, Macintosh is not exempt from viruses. They are uh, being uh, attacked now and then, so we have to be careful. With that. So we do uh, encourage people if they wish to bring their own device. We will make every effort to make it compatible with our system. If it is not compatible with our system, we'll do whatever we can to make their use comfortable, but we do require antivirus on their machines, both for our protection and theirs. Um, we're going to be expanding. We're looking at Google Apps for Education. I hope to have that in place at least by between Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, with Google Docs and calendars. Currently, we're using paper calendars in the district. I think that's way beyond its time. If you want to sign up for a computer lab at the high school, you go to the office, and one of the office ladies will take your name down. We've got to get away from that. So Google Docs will give us that. Calendar will give us that. Then we will begin to move our mail over from Groupwise into Gmail. And so we'll have that. And then monthly, we will open up every month. Feel free month. to cheer at any time. <laughs> <laughs> we will open up every month thereafter a new feature of the Google Apps uh, family, if you will, of applications. So we give people time to absorb little by little the, the overall offerings of Google. And I have to say they're fantastic. They call me all the time. If I have a question, they call me right back. So it's great to deal with them. And they've covered so much so well. They're doing a great job. We have Moodle in the district. Moodle is housed on our own servers inside. Uh, I'm moving to get away from that. Mr. Shelfo has uh, given me some information in the past on a product called Schoology. Uh, he's using it in, in his school. And we've uh, started using it at JFK and at the high school. And we hope to move from Moodle to Schoology. It's web-based. It's outside of our district. Uh, we'd rather have things that are more cloud-based and secure and more modern in their interface rather than Moodle. And also we can transfer Moodle into Schoology so teachers won't lose all the work that they've spent years uh, preparing. So we're looking to do that. And we continue to look for more cloud-based solutions. I would be much happier if we had more things in the cloud than inside. That will require a bigger pipe, if you will, um, meaning we need a faster internet connection. We have expanded to a 100 meg pipe from Comcast. It's a business class service, and it's already being phased in at the high school, and the speeds are a lot better. We'll be expanding that out to JFK and the rest of the district. We'll, we're also working on a new firewall, uh, which will allow teachers to go to sites that are blocked. They'll have to put their name their password and a reason why they're going there. 
so that later if they say, well, I win because it has to do with history and we find out it's not really history. <laughs> Uh, at least have a record, but at the time when they need it in class, they'll be able to get there, rather than have to send down to the help desk, oh, I need this unblocked, well, it was a teachable moment, I had to wait three days for it to open up, forget it now, I can't use it. I lost that, uh, that timing. So we, we have to do a little bit of change in our business practice, too. We have to make things more accessible um, to the users. And we have some issues that we have to look at. Uh, coming attractions, again, we're looking at replacing hardware, a new firewall system, increased bandwidth. Our website, the Northampton Public Schools website, has been, um, let's say, neglected for a while. There are a number of names on the website uh, they are no longer with us. And so uh, I've asked Trish Duffy, who's a former integration specialist for the district. She was at uh, high school as well, and she's retired. And I've asked her because she has a great interest in still helping out the Northampton Public Schools to work with us. And she's already moved in the high school website, which was separate last year, uh, has brought it in to the uh, domain of Northampton Public Schools. She's also working with Jim Miller, the athletic director, to create his own page for all the athletic events. She's working with Guidance, and Guidance will maintain their own page with all the links and resources students need for college. And um, she's going to be working with the elementary schools to bring all those schools uh, up to date and get all the staff uh, names and information correct. Um, and the challenge, the challenge is moving forward with what we have now. Uh, I know there is a number out there of 300,000 and I can't plan on that. It's wonderful uh, if it does happen, but I have to make plans for what if it doesn't happen or only a part of it happens. And so uh, we continue to face that challenge of moving forward adding as much as we can uh, without that plan Any questions? Any, uh, Ms. Yeah, I just want to know if you need permission to take a breath, because I don't think you've stopped this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, once I get rolling, it's okay. <laughs> How long have you been with us? Uh, eight weeks, a little bit longer than Laurie. <laughs> Just, it's, it's astounding to me how um, much you've learned about where technology is and isn't in this district and, and how on top of it you seem to be already. I'm just, I'm so impressed. Just that. And I will be the first one, I've told you, to clap loudly when we're in Mountain Brickles. Ms. Brick. Well, I'd like to second what Stephanie said. Um, it's just really refreshing to to have someone as our technology director who is both um, an educator and a technology person, as you said that you were, and who understands technology integration in the classroom. It's just the most refreshing concept. Come, come around with technology since I've been on the school committee, I think. So I'm excited and thrilled about that. Um, and I would, I would just tell the members of the school committee who are not on the Rules and Policy Committee that we have been considering what our technology policy looks like, and it's very complex, but I'm excited that we're going to figure that out in a way that makes sense, too provides the safeguards that we need in the district, but he's been a huge help on that. And finally, I would like to ask you what the prospects are, once you get all of these other things nailed down, what the prospects are for students to be able to create their own videos and have a, a YouTube of sorts where they can share videos made in robotics or science class or English or social studies, whatever it is. I think that our our students are already way ahead of a lot of us in their tech skills, and I think that would be an interesting and challenging way for them to to deal with things, and it's something that we haven't been able to provide them completely so far. 
and, and there's just there are so many new products that are out now. You don't need the fancy video cam or flip cams. There are cell phones that'll do videos. It's a matter of just getting the software that you can take these videos, join them together, whether it's Windows Movie Maker, whether it's iMovie, whether whatever you're using to create those little snippets, put those little snippets together to create the movie and I, then just upload. I just have been to several conferences where I've seen a lot of software that was designed specifically for schools that provides the security that you need so that the videos are not going necessarily out into the world. Mm -hmm. They are used within the school setting and it's carefully controlled but yet the students have the opportunity to share with their fellow classmates what they created so in a, in a controlled way yeah I just like to see us be able to offer that to our students as well and to kind of relate to that with Google Apps uh, once we get into Google Apps and we bring the students in we can create a student group so students can email within Northampton K12 US they won't be able to email out to Hotmail or have anyone from Hotmail MS in, but yet teachers will be able to communicate with students. Teachers will be able to email in and out because naturally they need to contact parents and so on, but the student group inside, and that'll be a great help because a number of our students use Prezi, which is an online presentation system, and more and more as you use these programs that are web-based, you need to have an email to register. And a number of our students don't have an email and they can't register. So if they're in a computer class, whether it's at JFK or at the high school, and they want to have an account, they're prevented from participating. And so this way, it'll be a bona fide email. It'll be <coughs> one of our emails. And they'll be able to make use of these other resources. So I think that'll open the door to, to more things that, that they can experience. I, I just wanted to say that. Uh, I may be showing my geek flag by, by talking about this, but this is stuff that gets me really excited. Um, firewalls and auto replacement and things like that. Um, I've, had a, I've, I've really enjoyed talking with Angelo about, about how these things can work in the school environment, and he's got a, he's got a tough job ahead of him. Uh, but I, I'm really just thrilled with the, the work you've done so far, and I just want to commend you on that. It's, it's great. I actually had a question, um, and it, it it concerns the domain name for for email and and the migration to Google Apps. Um, we, when we did it on the city side, we had a number of sort of some disparate. Um, some of our departments had their own email addresses, and so we the move to Google Apps allowed us to actually unify all of those um, under just NorthamptonMA.gov. Um, and I'm curious. Is the is the nps.k12.us is that a is that something that you'd be uh, that you would be stuck with if you move to the Google Apps to a cloud-based email server or how what would what would be the options there? The NPS site, mm -hmm. which is still around, was actually hosted by MechNet. It was the Merrimack Education mm -hmm. Consortium, I believe, mm -hmm. and. We don't do business with them anymore. Okay. And so that, even though that name is still around, it's not part of us. We're mm -hmm. strictly North A12 US. Okay. So that'll be our domain because that's what our group wise email is, and we're just going to keep that because that's what people are familiar okay. with. And also our, our website is just www A12 US. So it'll all be uniform and. Okay. Other questions? So you mentioned about once we're in, in using Gmail as a staff, the staff can then email parents and stuff. I, I know in the past there's been concern about email trails in the year and I guess people discouraged from using email for communication as much as possible. Are we moving away from that so that we can open lines of communication better or are we? Um, well, not necessarily because. Okay. Um, you know, all of our email communications are public documents, unless, of course, they're personnel records or confidential student records. But, uh, so we still have to be careful and cautious about how we do it. So same, same procedure, just system. Right. More efficient and effective. We will, we will still have the, 
the server that dumps every night and the retention the backup, for right. so long and all um, of those things. Right. And we're trying to expand that and upgrade it. You know, we have an email uh, archival system and we'll continue to use that with Google. We've already researched that and it's easy just to connect to it. So we'll still have that. It's by law we need to. There was no problem canceling the contract with whoever was archiving things before. We were archiving it ourselves. Oh, I thought we had a somebody that was doing it for like nine years or something. But they had to keep all of our emails. Mr. Moore? Um, yeah, I was wondering if, if in this in this APEX you have um, got an impression. There, I, I think we assume that, that everybody, all the students, have access sort of at home to some computer thing. but. I think that's probably mostly true, but do we have any idea about students who don't? And I'm sure there are. And um, do we have any any sort of thoughts about how we can address that? I've asked a number of teachers about that, uh, and also about cell phones. About five to six percent of students don't have computers at home, and five to six percent don't have phones. A lot of students have phones, but not smartphones. And there's a difference and so things that we would want to do in class where we could do things in class with smartphones a lot of kids are left out because they don't have a cell phone so we're trying to figure out how can we expand our use of phones either it's a student response system because now your phone can be a student response system you can put a multiple choice question and if you don't have a smartphone you can still text and so you can still get away from it that way. Uh, other districts that I know about, what they've done is they've lent out laptops or netbooks overnight to students who don't have a computer at home. Uh, what they've done is they've had a wireless connection with a Verizon card in it. A student takes it home. Uh, Brockton leaps to mind because I know Brockton did it. And I met one of the tech people from Brockton one day and I asked him, is there a problem with that? And they said, it's amazing, we never have problems. The parents are so grateful to have that machine at home that it always comes back. There's never a problem, there's never a loss, there's never damage. There is a certain amount of funding that's required to have that on hand to lend it out. But that's a possibility. Mr. Ball. I just saw on TV, I believe it was this morning, that um, the they just stated the direction of computers could become obsolete because I believe probably the iPad and the tablets and stuff like that. But I just, just mentioned that, that just today that they said that the PC is dead. Obsolete. So it's going to be really hard, I think, to catch up with ourselves and then catch up with and keep catching up. But you have done a good job. Thank you. Any other comments? Did you have any closing remarks? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Now we'll move on to the MCAS data and Superintendent Salzer. Right, I'm going to give you an overview of some of the MCAS results and uh, I included a 25 page uh, report in your packet. Uh, some data, I'm not going to go through that page by page. However, I do understand if uh, after my overview today, if you'd like more specific data, I will have Joanna McKenna do a PowerPoint for you and give you more data to the questions that you may have after tonight's presentation. But well, looking at the big picture, um, we're, the focus for the Department of Education this year is to move kids out of learning. So they want to move kids out of learning into the, and they want to focus on moving kids from proficient to advanced. So that is the focus of our strategic efforts this year. Um, and many people are going to ask. We always focus on the kids at the bottom and the kids at the top. Why don't we focus on the kids in the middle? And the word I got from our DSAC representative is we don't have the luxury of focusing on the middle right now. We have to focus on the kids in the morning, and we have to focus on getting more kids into advanced. I can't hear you really well. Who, who said that? Um, Donna Harlan is our DSAC representative okay. from the Department of Education. Okay. And so that is the... So the task that our district is assigned with for this year. We need to increase the challenge of our curriculum and also lend more support to our students um, with special needs so that they can be successful in the MCAS at all grades. 
As you know, we are, our status is that we're level three, and what level three means is that if one of our schools, which as you know is Bridge Street School, falls in the bottom 20% of performance in the state, then that school is labeled level three, and any district that has a level three school is labeled level three overall. And so it is incumbent upon me and uh, us as a district to make sure that I focus the efforts and the money um, on Bridge Street to bring them up out of level three, which lifts the district out. When we, you know, connected with this status and with this task from the state is some money. And we were given $25,692 this year to help support um, our work in these areas, and that is up $4,000 from last year on what they gave to us. Uh, I have a lot of ideas for that money, more ideas than there is money. Uh, but that money is going to be targeted at Bridge Street and focused on literacy development. Uh, on math support and additional math uh, programs, maybe before school or after school, and also on professional development for the teachers so that they can uh, better work with the students in an inclusion setting, which I think is a strategy we need to increase at Bridge Street. Uh, in addition, um, w you know, w with the MCAS results, we are measured on our adequate yearly progress. So we're measured against ourselves to some extent too at this point. And we have to make certain increases uh, in order to continue to you know, move up uh, in our status as well. This year, the MCAS is gonna be specifically based on the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. And that's something we've been working on in our schools, connecting our curriculum to the frameworks. And it's uh, our job to teach every child in our schools, the curriculum within these frameworks, and then we will be able to make our adequate yearly progress. MCAS is, an, is a good tool. MCAS is important, but I think I don't need to remind you that we all know that the whole child is what's important to us in Northampton Public Schools, and it's what's hap important to our teachers in every classroom. And I want to acknowledge and make sure that we are aware of our award-winning programs in art and music in physical education and our strong world language programs that um, we don't want to get carried away and focus too hard on just the MCAS results. We want to look at our school district as a whole. And as you heard tonight, the quality and successful programs in our advanced placement at the high school as a result of the K-12 learning that our kids do. It's important for me to point out that the high school, which is, was uh, level one high school, had fallen to level two this year. Kind of a surprise. When following the report that you heard tonight. Uh, again, we missed our targets on the test scores, our students who were English language learners and students in special needs and those two subgroups, we missed our targets and the total that we missed um, in those two areas was uh, four students. So if four of those students would have scored higher, um, the high school would have remained level one. So that's how specific uh, this grading is. Four out of how many? Excuse me, four out of how many students? In those uh, subgroups. Like, oh, okay. So oh, okay. Of those two subgroups. Do you know how many? I don't know the total oh. number. I don't have that right in front of me. So at Bridge Street, uh, what I want to do is, as I said, use the money to focus on students with special needs. And what I'm recommending is that we want to not only increase the academic support by getting kids into the regular edu education classroom more often. We need more inclusion. That's how we're going to raise the level of expectation and curricular challenge for these kids. But also uh, get them used to um, the curriculum that's expected of all of our students. And the only way they're going to do that is by being in class with them. But of course, there's coaching and teaching that has to go on for the teachers and the special education teachers in order to co-teach. Not only do we want to increase their academic skills, but we also need to focus on their test-taking skills. As I looked at the results with uh, Donna Harlan uh, just on Tuesday, uh, we found that there are many students who left multiple choice answers blank. And uh, we all know that multiple choice, you don't want to leave the answer blank. <laughs> Take chance. <laughs> Take an educated guess. And so with test taking skills, we can help kids eliminate of the four choices, what are the two best, and from there, try to select an answer. Um, and taking a chance on an answer is much better than leaving an answer blank. Overall, when you look at our scores compared to ourselves over the last couple of years, our performance was stable this year compared to last year. In some areas, we increased. In some areas, we declined in English language arts and in math uh, at the elementary level. And we're going to put targeted support in place for these students and for these teachers. This year and the spring will be MCAS as usual. 
However, next year, we're going to move to the PARC testing. That is the Partnership of Assessment for Readiness for College and Career. When we move to PARC, obviously we have a new set of data, new test scores. It would be more difficult to measure our, our performance compared to previous years, but they're still going to do it. They're going to have a formula for MCAS and PARC, and it will take four years to phase out MCAS because we only use the previous four years of data. For us in Northampton, this year is a good year because our data from four years ago that's falling off um, was our lowest performing data. So our average is going to be, we'll see an improvement in our average just because of that. With the new park assessment, uh, we're going to need increased technology. We're going to need improved infrastructure and um, computers and computer labs because that is an online test. And so our district has to begin to get prepared uh, for that test and that's why we are working with capital planning which you'll hear more about in a little bit and Angela is working to prepare our system so that our kids will be able to take this test in two years. That test is reportedly going to be more comprehensive, more in-depth knowledge uh, for students to demonstrate and also will include more writing, persuasive writing and structured writing skills so our teachers who have been working with the Writers' Workshop model for the past few years are on track to prepare our kids for success in those exams. Our progress was good on our growth model overall. Um, there are a couple of highlights. Uh, the Hispanic students at JFK had exceptional performance. They met and exceeded their target, and that was a huge leap forward for that subgroup um, over previous years. Other subgroups are not very far off their goal. But as I said, we have to focus on getting these students and these subgroups from warning into needs improvement and uh, move forward. The good news is that we have our school data teams in place that are focusing on identifying the skills needed to learn um, to move these kids forward. And I wanted to mention that uh, another highlight is that Ryan Road not only met but exceeded the target for students with special needs. And one of the reasons um, I feel and Marty Riddle feels uh, for this success is the high percentage of students who are included in regular education classrooms. That's the standard way of doing business at Ryan Road. And so we want to increase that practice across the district. Uh, the good news, uh, again, from the Department of Education that our school improvement plans and our district improvement plan are focused exactly on addressing all of the challenges and that our objectives are in place to ensure individual achievement. So uh, we were complimented on our work and I mentioned that that was a collaborative effort from the school committee and the administrative leadership team. We built that together last January. We've revised it and edited it and put it in place. and. Uh, they uh, wanted to acknowledge that and uh, the good work that we did on that. And so for the end of my notes. However, on your packet, I'm only going to pull out three sheets that I want to highlight uh, for you tonight. As I said, then I'll pause for questions and we can bring back more specific data for a presentation next month if you'd like. If you wanted to look at page five, you would see Jackson Street School. And what this report does is it follows a cohort of kids. So it's not just comparing grade five for the last three years, it's comparing the same group of kids, grade three, grade four, grade five, and it factors out the kids who came new to the school or left the school. So this is the cohort of kids that took this test, the 45 students, as you see there at the bottom, um, and their performance in math over those three years. And you can see the dramatic increase in students who scored advanced and proficient. And uh, unfortunately, the warning stayed um, still. So that's something that we have to focus on in getting those kids from warning into needs improvement. The next one I wanted to highlight was on page nine. And that was JFK's math. <laughs> same subgroup of kids as the same 140 kids from 2008 to 2012. And you can see the uh, dramatic increase again in advanced and proficient in those students in 2012 and grade eight and just the minimal number of students who are in warning and needs improvement. And finally, on page 10, you'll see NHS and their group of kids from 2006 to 2012. And if you can look at what happened to those students, uh, the advanced and proficient is uh, just absolutely amazing, um, the progress of those students over those uh, six years. I will stop there and hear your questions, thoughts, or comments. Mr. Vall? 
I just have a question. You said that we're on um, Bridge Street's the um, three and the level three, right? Right, and um, the high school's level two. Are, is it correct to assume that the rest are all level one? Yes. So Ryan Road got out of its standing. Yes. Oh, yes. Wow. They had great success this year, this past year. And also, the other thing is that um, North Hampton High School, that page, that, the last page, not only did the advance go up from 12% in 2006 to 59% now, but the warning and the failing went from 13 all the way down to 4. That's, right. that's really incredible. Right. Okay, any other questions about the uh, MCAS data? Okay. I'm hearing none, then we'll move into the review of the uh, superintendent's capital planning proposal. I wasn't prepared for that. I thought that we'd be on that for another 10 minutes. Okay, we'll <laughs> move along. <laughs> That's great. All right, so capital planning, uh, Mr. McLaughlin has been working with Mr. Kowski, and they met last night. They're gonna meet every Wednesday for the next four Wednesdays on capital planning overall, and so I would like to ask Mr. McLaughlin to summarize where we are with that. Okay, I'm going to steal a little bit of narrative uh, that had previously said uh, by uh, Chris Brennan and Angelo uh, in regards to uh, allergy, and I will use some of their emphasis when I get to the chart that you folks have. But um, I've been working with Central Services, Mike Demon and Jason Doyle, in the submission of these capital projects and this capital project list. There's about 36 projects on the list that have been identified uh, that were presented last week to the Budget and Property Committee. And we went over each of the items uh, that were on that list. Uh, the decision by the committee was to move all the projects forward um, as identified in a priority summary list, uh, which you have. And uh, the main emphasis uh, that we talked about in the need of meeting school improvement pro uh, uh, the school improvement program, the, the district improvement plan, um, meeting our uh, NEASC and our park testing um, happens to be technology. And if you look at the chart that you do have, um, those are the two items that are at the very top of the chart. Um, the capital technology improvement plan, uh, Angelo referred to $300,000. Um, what you don't have here is all the detail that makes up the $300,000, but uh, it's been reviewed and gone over as to how do we start where we are now, move forward to meet the technology needs that Angelo outlined, uh, either through um, um, smartphones, either through uh, laptops, notepads, uh, wireless, um, uh, a stronger backbone in the system, uh, improvements uh, throughout uh, all the buildings. And when all, the, all of it was put together, it came up to $300,000 uh, to move our district forward from where we are right now. And um, the second part of the technology is a new student information system. Right now we are on a star-based system, which is the student information system. Um, the company that supports that has been bought out. The system will be uh, uh, phased out as of June 30th. It will no longer be supported after that date. Um, Angelo and I have been talking. There's going to be a uh, review committee to review the star-based system as it exists now, look at what we want uh, for the future, what the needs are of the district. There's going to be a committee that's going to be put together to assess that. Um, we do need a student information system, which is uh, the backbone of, of our reporting to the Department of Education um, by there, there's hundreds of categories by age, by grade, by testing scores, and um, everything you can think of uh, that gets put into the system, and this is used every day. Uh, but we do need to um, uh, get a new system. So there's going to be an evaluation going forward. Right now, with the star base system in our budget, we have $22,000 budgeted for the current system, which is only a 
maintenance, ongoing upkeep, licensing type of fee with the Starbase system. The $25,000 that you see here is in addition to what's currently in our local budget. So what we're really looking at is about a $45,000 expenditure moving forward for a new student database system uh, to be used in the district. So the $25,000 is the incremental uh, charge to get into a new system, uh, transfer over, swap over data, uh, get training, get support for that, besides any other licensing and any other uh, maintenance that's needed. So the two top items, again, the capital planning and the student information. The remaining items that are on the list are more of building structural, uh, building improvements, some of them are safety, some are for security, some are because they are uh, going to become building issue, code issues. Um, I'm sure all of you have read through them. Um, they've been prioritized by central services by the urgency in which they believe they should be addressed. So they labeled items by the project as whether it's high, medium, or low. And then they looked at what they thought would be the appropriate year to have certain items put into the capital plan. So it was looked at from a couple different perspectives. So what you have is the chart laid out from 2013 to 2018. One of the criteria that I wanted to have into this capital plan was not just the immediate issues that we think of, that we know of, but I asked to look uh, at all issues, even though they might not be important today and need to be immediately addressed, but to be addressed in its entirety so we know that these projects are out there. We have looked at them, so you as a committee know that we have items that uh, are there, but will be of concern later on, two, three, four, five years down the road. So we wanted to put as much onto the list as possible so you could see what's there, so you can be aware of what they're looking at and uh, how they view it in a priority list. So these 36 items that you have in front of you total $2,846,000 of improvements uh, in the totality of all the items together. and. Um, we had our first capital planning meeting yesterday. Um, Ed Sahowski and myself are two members that are on the committee. Uh, I believe by ordinance there's a certain number of positions that are on this committee and I'm looking at you, Mr. Mayor, to say yes. to confirm that. Yes, that is correct. And, and they include a school committee representative and the, and the business manager from the school okay. department. Thank yeah. you. As well as a city councilor, as well as um, I appoint um, three residents of the city as well, just at, generally. Yeah. And the finance director and auditor also serve as staff to the committee. Okay. So last night we had the first meeting. Uh, there were a couple of presentations that were made to the committee uh, uh, at that meeting, but uh, it was very carefully uh, placed with the finance director where she, Susan Wright had given an overview of the capital process, what we are looking at, what we want to try to achieve as a capital committee, what we are charged with when we are looking at capital projects, also understanding the city debt status of where we are, um, knowing what current projects we have that are being funded, uh, the amounts of money through principal and interest. So there was some fairly extensive background information that was shared at the beginning of our capital process to put us all in the right framework as we look forward to all of the projects. So um, we, uh, as a school district, are coming up next week uh, for our presentation to the, uh, the overall committee um, in expressing our needs and capital uh, desires as we see fit and move forward. So um, what you have here, the three member budget and property committee uh, as members of the school committee have looked at this and they have agreed that this is what we are gonna put forward to the 
citywide uh, capital committee. So you have a copy of it. And if I can answer any questions of items that are on there, I will give it a go. Mrs. Minnick. Um, earlier, Ms. Duvall mentioned something about trying to be more green in our district, and I know we've had some some uh, requests expressed in the past to do something about the styrofoam trays used for lunches at Ryan Road School, and the answer was we can't get rid of them until we redo the kitchen and the cafeteria at Ryan Road School. And yet I noticed that it's way down the list like six years from now with a low priority listing. And I'm wondering if that's just based on age of equipment and, stump and that it's been listed there or if there was consideration given to actually revamping the way we do business and would that elevate its status any? Well, I'll start by saying, let's yeah. clarify, I don't believe we used styrofoam trays anymore. Last year we bought um, dishwasher. Last year that changed last okay. year. Excellent. So styrofoam I'm trays. Behind. I'm sorry, but have, that's, that's yeah, styrofoam know. trays last year had been removed from the service line, and we have compostable type. Um, the paper trays. I don't know how I missed that, but I'm really excited about it because that's been one of my concerns since I got on the school committee 20 years ago. So I'm <laughs> glad to know that there is progress over time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so then, for that reason, this was considered less of a Probably priority. Not need. for that reason. No, I just no, want to clarify. Just because. The okay. Trays. Well, I mean it. If we aren't using styrofoam and filling up the landfill with it, then it does, in my mind, become less of a priority. I'm j so I'm just curious how it wound up with the priority that it had. So. The priority it had, uh, when I went back to look at it and, and reviewed it with capital, or excuse me, with central services, it was one of those projects that they didn't, they, because they're looking at the facility structure from a structural point of view and a need uh, of replacement or repair became a low priority from their facility. The replacement of a chimney, replacement of uh, boilers, you know, those type of things became a higher priority than upgrading that kitchen facility. Okay. Um, if the committee wishes to change that priority to a, a higher priority, I'm uh, I'll, I'll do whatever you would like, but it was only put at that priority because of um, other items that ha had a higher need. Had higher need, okay. Thank you. Mr. Bourne. Is that a question? I mean, are we reasonably confident that uh, the technology improvement plan would be, will go through? We have no idea, I mean, at this point. We don't know. Um, as it was explained last night, there is uh, a, a few different pools of money. There is uh, $250,000 of available, uh, and I'll use the word that Susan used last night, free cash. Uh -huh. uh, that's available. There is uh, some other monies, uh, $650,000 in the stabilization fund um, that is uh, not earmarked, and there is the potential for some added changes into the debt schedule uh, that could result in some savings, but also some of the interest fa interest that was factored into that debt schedule uh, might be uh, a little bit uh, high, so we might earn a little bit more interest in the interest principal process. So. I guess my question is, is there an opportunity in that presentation to kind of show where our technology is today and where we'd like it to be, what that gap is, and what it would mean for students? That was something Brian and I talked about earlier this morning in discussion uh, with Angelo. Next Wednesday, I believe, we're scheduled uh, to be able to make our pitch for our money. Um, and Angelo and Mark would be the ones to do that. I'm trying to see if we can get that rescheduled, if we can swap places with someone. 76 so Radio Shack computer that you bring in for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to be there, and I can't be there uh -huh. no, next Wednesday, but I can be there the following Wednesday, so we're going to try to swap places so that I can be there to advocate for it Good. as well. Uh, but at least Mark and Angela will be there if I can't switch. Uh, okay. But right now, um, that's the best information that Susan can give us uh, overall. 
and uh, I know Angela will go into detail as to what makes up the 300,000. So um, I don't know until we get farther through the process. Ms. Pitt. Can you just give us a quick picture of um, kind of the process for how, how all the various departments are presenting their priorities? So last night you had a meeting for the first time. Was it, you said there were some presentations. Was that, was that from various departments? Forbes the Library uh, presented as well as... I didn't hear you, Ed. Forbes Library did a presentation. Yep. And the building inspector. Those are the two. So, so we uh, every, I, every meeting, like a different, some different departments will present, like so fire and correct. DPW and police. And police, fire, DPW, they're scheduled, not next week, but scheduled the week after as, as the schedule's built right now. And so the process is that cap, the Capital Improvement um, Committee hears all of the presentations and then they make decisions about how to meet up one? They They're going to listen to all the, all the uh, presentations of need we all have documentation. What we had to do, if I back up uh, a couple of weeks, when I sat with uh, Angelo and I sat with uh, Central Services, we came up with a list. We had to come up with single documentations of the life expectancy of any of the capital projects, uh, if, if our cost estimates were based on engineers, architect designs, vendor quotes, uh, three bid, formal bid process. There was a fairly detailed analysis that was uh, devised to determine where we are and how we arrived at our numbers and our projects that we had to submit. So I had to submit 36 different uh, projects to uh, the finance director to put together with all the other departments in the city to come up with the entire um, two-inch book that we're working with for all the submitted uh, capital projects that everybody's looking to have. So that has all the detail and the documentation to that. So as we go through the next four or five weeks, each department will be presenting to the committee and we will at the end sit there and go through a discussion process and evaluate on a particular scoring mechanism to t determine what are the recommendations that come out of this committee. And it will essentially be a lar sort of a, a, a larger version of what Mr. McLaughlin has presented. It'll be a seven-year plan with projects prioritized for each year. Um, and those will be recommendations made to me. And then I'm obligated to then um, take those recommendations and come up with a final plan that I present to the City Council uh, for uh, approval and funding. And, and just one further thing, in budget and property, the um, 300000 for um, technology improvement was actually broken down into several categories. Did, will the Capital Improvement Committee understand that it's not 300000 or nothing for technology? Correct. That, that, oh, yeah. That, that was part of uh, a discussion I had with Angelo in regards to um, we have to understand that there's still only so much money that becomes available in free cash and how that gets uh, divided up will come out of this particular group but if there are uh, portions of the 300,000 and we can do $150,000 and get ourselves uh, in a, in, a, in a situation where we're staged for future success, yes, let's move forward with the 150000 And that was part of the discussion I had with the superintendent this morning of how the best way to present that to the committee to make it understandable that it's just not a chunk of money that we all or none. That's a question if I can. Uh, Mr. Tchaikovsky, in your role on the committee, do you just have a decision-making role, or are you also in the position where you can advocate for the schools that cross-purposes for what you're doing? Well, it's, I certainly would. Uh, when when we go to prioritize at the end, uh, in a few weeks, we'll use a really basic uh, scale of one, two, and three, and we'll go through each department and label it as a one, two, or a three. So I guess... Uh, Trying to remain neutral, I would listen to all the requests and know that, um, you know, being being a resident of Northampton, mm -hmm. all those things would be important to the overall goodness of, mm -hmm. of Northampton in so many ways. But I certainly would be looking towards the um, the school department's needs as well, making sure that um, you know 
my voting and rating uh, would reflect what I know most closely and dearly to me being on the school committee. Does that make sense? It does. <laughs> I just didn't want to leave you out when I said Angelo, Mark, and I will want to do this presentation to advocate for the schools. I didn't want to leave you out of that, sure. but I didn't quite know your role, and that makes sense to me. I, I have a question. What are the what are the canopies? The canopies are a canopy that goes over the the main entrances and the doors to the building. Um, there had been a um, a review of water coming in through some of the main doors and how it gets brought into the building, and there was some prior discussion prior to me about having canopies put over those doors to eliminate that type of, uh, um, you know, influx of water and rain, snow, snow. and everything else coming in the buildings. Okay, and um, also, I, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, yeah? I was just going to, it's already quarter of 10. I think we should talk, if we're going to talk about the start time, I think we should do well. We're all reasonably awake, so if we can kind of wrap up this part of the evening. Okay. I'll keep my remark brief, if I, I might, because I did want to bring it up in regards to the funding. Uh, Susan Wright is doing some work along with the, the uh, forgive me for not knowing the, the woman's name, but she uh, is the, the uh, auditor. The auditor, thank you. Yes. Yeah. In going through a lot of the capital improvement um, allocations in the past and finding money that hasn't been expended yet and looking at that. so. For example, every year, or at least every year, monies have been given to different groups uh, to fund projects. Some of those projects are still being funded and haven't been completed. Others have been completed and they came in under bid, and so there's little pockets of money still available um, that have been allocated, for example, to the school department. And we're gonna be asking each uh, department that comes to speak to whether or not that um, that project is completed and if that money that was given to be used for that project can now be, I think it's called reprogrammed mm -hmm. into one of the current projects that we're looking at. So there may be opportunities um, to look at um, some of these school projects that uh, their money is still available uh, to move that into a reprogrammed money into some of our new projects. So even though we might not get an allocation from the city as much as we want, we may still get some money coming in through an old project that we can reprogram that money to, if that makes sense. And I was unaware of that, something that hasn't been done um, as far as I can remember being on the, the Capital Improvements Committee, but it does look like a, a way that we may be able to bring in a few more dollars. That had been done just most recently with some of the money that was in the pool filter account that was transferred over so we could complete the repair of the track. So we had already done one reprogramming of some of those uh, monies that were determined that it wasn't needed to re replace certain p parts of the pool filtering system and it did get moved. So that helped finish off and get the track uh, resurfaced. It requires a vote of the city council so that it's not, we just can't reprogram it. We I have to go back to up um, yeah. on those holes over at the DPW. Exactly. We reprogrammed some money yeah. for, a, for a project that had been phased out and moved it to, the, to do the repairs in the barn. Um, but it, there's, other, there's lots of other implications because in some cases we bonded the money and so there are rules around that and very, so the, the, we have to be very clear about the intent and how it was used and so um, so that's that's part of also part of the calculation but clearly a school project moving to another school project there shouldn't be big issues around that so I'd like to finish my question that's okay certainly thank you um, the other question I had was um, Jackson Street are, are, they have nothing down here um, through 218 are they fine I asked the same thing of Central Services. They did not have uh, any urgent issues to put on the capital list. They do have some issues that fall below the $10,000 threshold that some of that they can repair, uh, improve upon with the normal uh, maintenance budget. Okay, so. Um, 
Are there any other questions regarding the capital planning proposal? Okay. So this was, you were not asking for a vote on this, you just wanted to no, review it with the school committee. Okay, right. excellent. So the next item before us is uh, returning to um, an item that we continued from the last meeting, which concerns uh, school start time. Um, as you may recall, we considered the three proposals uh, that were brought to us by the superintendent uh, last time. There was some discussion, um, and then um, there was a uh, 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 request that uh, an idea that uh, Mr. Meyer came up with um, uh, be looked at in the intervening time um, bet bet between last meeting and this meeting um, and ask the superintendent to come back uh, to discuss uh, the possibilities of that. So I, I guess mm -hmm. the first step may be to just hear from you about that. Right. Thank you. So we'll pick up uh, from there. Uh, the document they have in your packet is uh, the first three proposals are the same as what you saw last month. Um, however, in the discussion, you'll see proposal four. Uh, uh, Downey Meyer asked me to consider uh, another series of times that we thought of right during the meeting, and in taking it back uh, to the team, the times that he had uh, wouldn't have worked. However, we just made some few minor adjustments and came up with something that would work along the same lines. Uh, and you can see that there in proposal four. But my comment to you as a school committee is that these other, the first three proposals were given to the public in August, and they had a month to look at it before the September meeting. And so now at this point, the public has seen these for three, for two months. So they've been able to really weigh in on it. Uh, with this proposal, if you want to seriously consider it, I would ask for the same consideration that we take it back to the public. I take it to the high school and high school teachers, let them weigh in on it and then we bring it back. So if you do want to consider this, I would just ask for some time to vet it properly so we're not shortcutting the process. At that meeting, um, Howard Moore also asked me to reconsider the two-tier system, asking me why it wouldn't work. Um, I, I don't think we're ever gonna really see this the same way, and Howard and I spent a bit of time together talking through this uh, between the last uh, meeting and now. Um, if from th my team's perspective, there just aren't enough seats for all the riders in the two tiers. And I know from Howard Moore's perspective, there are enough seats um, to do two tiers. We just, we can't seem to get to a meeting, meeting point on that. Um, and then if, if we did consider that, um, the hub system at the elementary schools uh, is something that would really have to be vetted with the public so they understand um, the, the full meaning of that. And I would, my, my fear, my caution is that the principals and the teachers and the parents would really not be in favor of that if we vetted it out. But I'm willing to if that's uh, the recommendation of the committee. So uh, would you want to possibly just walk through proposal four again just so the, uh, oh, the public who's people at home, who, I'm sorry. Who, who don't have this in front of them could just right. hear that. So the, if there were a uh, proposal four, then uh, JFK would start at 755, which it does now, and we would end it at 225. I can't figure out why JFK was at six hours and 35 minutes when six and a half hours is more the standard. Um, so we would just adjust that, which would help us with the pickup times so that the buses have time uh, to not make those uh, rushed trips at the end of the day. It would make JFK six and a half hours, cutting that by five minutes. NHS would move from 830 to three o'clock, and the elementary schools would move from 8.50 where they are, start now to 9 o'clock and go from 9 to 3.30. Um, that is including, remember, the extra 20 minutes that I'm asking for at, to be considered at the elementary schools, which of course would have to be negotiated through our collective bargaining process. I have a question. Mm -hmm. the, um, if it were to change, on option four, what time does that leave the bus coming? Is that leaving the bus coming for kids to have enough time to do after school studies and, and hang there because at that point and then go home at four? I mean, are they the third bus to be picked up or are you still school? You mean elementary schools? No, I mean the high school. The high school? No, um, with just a half an hour between high school and elementary school, there's still going to have to be just that five minute period for kids to get from class to the bus. Well, is there any way to move it to a later bus time for the high school students? 
considering the number of riders that ride it, and also the opportunities. They're older kids, so they'd have more opportunities to hang and study, get homework done, whatever. Well, I certainly would like to have a later bus at the high school. I'd also like to have it at the middle school so the kids could participate more in after-school activities. Um, remember that you've asked me to do this with uh, no, no additional cost, and so to... It, it would take some more studying, let me just say that, in order to make that happen. Yeah. Well, I, it would be instead of. I mean, right, the, the bus would come, in, would come later instead of earlier. So I, the reason I'm thinking right. that is because the elementary school time now going to 3.30, if, if the Tampai bus allowed for that, would the elementary students still have to get out later? Because we're adding on a whole other half hour to the time that they're getting done. And, and I'm not really mm -hmm. understanding it's kind of like the history, from what I gather, of why we changed the school start time in the first place mm. was based on logic and, and fiscal reasons, as right. opposed to philosophy. Right. And we've been talking about philosophical changes with the circadian rhythm and scientific, but also philosophical, and not doing it for money. I mean, for, for um, you know, one, we don't want it to cost more money, but it just concerns me, just put it right out there, it just concerns me that we, say, okay, we're gonna change the elementary time. I don't think that we've had forms on that. I don't think that um, people have been discussing that, um, the communities, the PTOs, the school councils, and we've been discussing for a while, years, I guess, the um, NS, NHS possible school start time changing and everything. And so, um, if it's fiscally driven, then it's okay to not have the forms, and yet if it's philosoph philosophically driven, you know, with difference in ideas and, and benefits for the students then we have these forums i think it's always best to have forums and let people weigh in on but changes nobody knows i mean i've talked to people nobody knows all over about what? the elementary school um time possibly changing and everyone i talk to is not aware of that hmm. but they're aware that there's a start time you know mm -hmm. school issue a, sc a school issue start time for the um for amp high but nobody's aware of it going till 3 30 and i think i mean that could affect people a lot Right. Well, as I said, if that is a proposal to consider, I would want to go back to the public forums and have that vetted. But aren't they all, isn't it in all of them, or did you change it back? I mean, because other than the first one, the proposal no, in number the, two. Yeah, it's in all of them. Yeah, they right. all changed. The, I mean, it, to me, it feels like it's just sliding by, as opposed to, I mean, no, we're trying to treat the whole child right, and, I'm, as a person. I'm not understanding if there's a question is there or not. Uh, I was talking about the day at the elementary school. Longer day. I'm talking about, we're talking about uh, extending the day at the mm -hmm. elementary school. To me, possibly. it just feels like it's just uh, getting slid on uh, in. There's not a form. It's not being discussed. It's not going mm -hmm. out there as far as how it will affect anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, Hamp High, we've been doing it. It's been going on for years. Mm -hmm. And it says that there's positive approaches and you know, positive um, reasons for doing it and for changing the start time. And yet, and we do have those forms, but for the elementary school, we don't. I just don't understand why it's we're not having forums and telling everybody how's this going to affect you and what do you feel about it and how do the principals of the elementary school buildings feel about it and how do the teachers feel about it and yet we had all those forums for the high school. It just seems to be to be in, in congruent. Ms. Pick? Um, I'll, I'll, I'd like to address that concern and then I'd like to make my own comments. Um, Actually, extending the elementary school day is something that we have been talking about on and off for years. And um, Bridge Street actually um, had grant money where they ran forums and, and really discussed this in depth. We weren't able to move forward on it, but um, it is something that um, that the administrative team, I think, has been looking at for a very long time. It's, um, um, I, I don't understand why we have a shorter day at the elementary school than we do at our middle school and high school, and it's really not equitable. It's something that would be negotiated with teachers, and it would be all pending negotiation. Remember, we're talking about doing something a year from now, almost a year from now. Um, I, I don't think it's just sliding by. I think that it is something that's been raised um, quite a lot. We haven't had forms on it yet. We certainly um, would be talking to parents about it, and we, we have not in maybe this, this um, go round. But I think that this is something that we that that we in um, retreats with the administrative team have actually talked about for years. Well, I understand that it's been talked about and discussed. But what I'm talking about is the is the the meet the out to the public. You said that it hasn't been um, you know discussed as of yet. But if we were to vote on proposal one, two, well, one is the same, but two or three is one the same. We would be changing it. They're all changed. Yeah. So it's and automatically this being, changing. This is what's being recommended for best learning at the elementary schools. 
I remember so, I, I presented that and spoke to it in August at the public forum, and I've been speaking to it all along. But it's not being, it, I mean, there's a lot of people that are not aware of it. I've there talked are. to people about mm -hmm. it, and there are not a lot of people from anywhere around that's that's not aware of, of our dilemma with the, new, the um, high school start time. So uh, I guess uh, to respond to that, the maybe the public forum wasn't enough, and I need to communicate it in a more uh, a larger variety of ways so that more people are aware of what I proposed so three months ago. So why are you changing ago. it? I mean, why the bottom line of why do you want to change the elementary school time? I, mean, I understand, but, but why do you want to change yeah. it? It's educationally sound. Okay, but the, the start. Yeah. I mean, they have all the data. The data here stating that to start the high school at a or at a later start time is educationally sound too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't seem. It seems like when we have to do something because of the money, then we find a way to do it. But I mean, or if it fits this into isn't our schedule. This is about the money, though. But it's not about the money. No, this is no. not about the money. No. It's not about keeping the buses the same way as they've been. No, no, I mean, the schedule so the kids can. This was, should be, this was like a bonus <laughs> when when the superintendent was looking at this plan. This was like an added bonus that we finally had a way to be able to do this. Right, but we haven't put it out to the public the way we have the the um, start time changes. I just saw this really. I mean, I've heard about it. And I've talked about. I mean, I've listened to it for a long time. But I just don't think that it's been out there. I haven't had any. You know, let's discuss at the elementary levels what's happening. I'd love to hear from uh, Miss Minnick because she's like our. Historian. So she's going to have a spaz attack. Well, yeah. I, too. I, I just. Um, Mr. Meyer had his hand up first, oh, yeah. so I, I apologize. <laughs> but but I, I I know you were, but he did have his hand up for for a while. So I. So I want to thank the superintendent and the transportation director and the administrative leadership team for taking my suggestion and investigating it and bringing forward a new possibility. Um, I hope that the change from 325 to 330, which is a, another five minute adjustment later, will not cause the elementary school parents and their community to oppose this. But I really think that this extra time in the buildings is something that is a bonus. Um, good ideas have many parents, and I want to claim at least some parentage that, it, you know, and, and Lisa, you probably had it five times before I did. <laughs> but when we were, when I was working with the interim superintendent to try to come up with some start times, I was hearing from people at Lead School, where I was quite often, about kids racing through lunch, about kids not having enough for, time for physical activity outdoors. We just went over the elementary school master schedule trying to increase time on learning. So there is a, is a great need to increase time at the elementary schools. And I think that this is, that's an educationally sound idea and I'm happy that the superintendent in arriving in this district is ready to push it forward from his experience in other districts in the state. Um, the movement from 815 to 830 is also excellent in terms of providing sleep. Um, you know, the, the study that I've looked at a lot is the one that says by the time our kids are 16 and 17, the middle of their sleep cycle is 445. And they should be getting eight to nine hours of sleep, which means that the time that they would be biologically waking up is around 845. So again, you can oppose the circadian clock. You can drink coffee. Your parents can hit you over the head. But as medical residents, had their schedule adjusted because after years and years of being told that the culture just says you get up and you work harder when you're sleepy, um, that has completely changed Okay, in the past five to 10 years. Now they have rules about what you can be required to do. I think the same sort of logic applies to our students. You can't tough your way out of being exhausted. So I think 815 to 830 is moving things in the right direction. So I really hope that the superintendent does what he has suggested go back to the community with this fourth possibility. It has, to, it has to have response from the community before we go forward. But I think it seems sound. And looking at the objections that have been raised before, it looks like it just might work. Um, Ms. Minnick and then Mr. Moore. Um, the, the birth of the, the times really came a number of years ago when the state put out requirements for time on learning and it was six and a half hours at the secondary level and six hours at the elementary level and we had to tweak 
some of our start and end, end times to lengthen the days at the, I can't remember whether it was the middle school or the high school, one of them was just a bit shy and we had to lengthen that day, but we were already well situated with the other schools. That's why the discrepancy. It is a discrepancy. It's, it was based on what they felt students needed at the time for time on learning, but it does leave a discrepancy in the working day for teachers. And if you're looking at our, our teachers association with a block of teachers as a whole, there is some inequity there. And to the extent that there were issues at the elementary schools with scheduling, it seems like and this was a convenient time. This was has nothing to do with transportation, but it was, as we're looking at start and end times and our transportation system, it was a good time for us to look at the possibility of lengthening the elementary day. And I think you heard the superintendent say it's not a fait accompli yet. It will have to be negotiated with the union. But I think it makes perfect sense. So that was my historical perspective on that. And um, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Moore, and then yeah. Mr. Bourne. Yeah, I'd like to uh, briefly, I just, there's a cup, couple of things um, to point out. I think probably the reason the JFK schedule is extra long, you know, five minutes more, was again about the bus schedule. I mean, anyway, there's always a few buses that are very late at JFK and the pickup in the afternoon. So my guess is they just lengthened the day because they couldn't get the buses here in time, even with starting them as fast as they could after NHS let out. Um, in ter and that really is what I want to talk about is the late bus. I think it's, I think it's um, Right now, right now we have even less ridership at, from the high school in the afternoon than we do in the morning. And in the morning we have a very low ridership regardless in terms of the percent overall population. And the reason we have a really low ridership in the afternoon is because kids do stuff at school. And if, and in fact there's a pretty reasonable thought that those kids who are riding the bus might prefer actually to be able to get help from their teachers or to be participating in clubs. It's, it's not unreasonable. And um, given the fact that it's such a small number of kids, we might actually increase our ridership if instead of insisting upon a bus that left at 3.02, um, if you do proposal number four, if you had a couple of buses that leave at 4 o'clock, um, which is what would be if even with the extended elementary, because some of those routes are only 20 minutes long. Um, if you don't have the extended elementary, then it's absolutely no issue to run a late, to, to, to just run the NHS buses later. Um, you know, when people say, well, we have to do it right after school, it's like, well, actually, look at the high school. Running it right after school is probably why we don't have very many kids on the bus. We're busy running a bunch of empty buses away from the high school every afternoon. That seems pointless. And it would seem like a really worthwhile thing to explore, just not not running a late bus and the regular bus, just run the regular bus late. Um, I think you wouldn't see at least the same ridership, and you might actually have some, we talked about, academic benefits of people being able to see their teachers after school. Because if it says 50 kids who currently cannot, that's 50 kids who could. So just to clarify, are, are you suggesting that the NHS and elementary be transposed on no. the No, I'm end very of the simply day. saying at the end of the day, the NHS buses would be the last buses of the day on any of these, on any of these proposed schedules, including the current schedule. The end times for school are the same. The buses just don't run when school's out. They run... They run an hour later or 40 minutes later or something enough whenever the bus schedule forces them to be. Mm -hmm. But rather than the bus schedule forcing them to be the moment school lets out, which deprives the kids who ride the bus of any opportunity to see their teachers, have it be whenever the bus schedule will allow it to be after that. So I'll no additional cost. I can look into it. Well, it may be an additional cost. Do you want me to respond? Sure. Uh, if you explain how um, it may. Well, I'm not sure, so I'm guessing here, but that's, <laughs> I'll make an educated guess. Uh, the bus contract is bid on the number of hours that the buses and bus drivers will be working for us. 
And so when they, you know, we have the start time, so they're picking kids up at 6.30, 6.45 in the morning. Now if we take the, the drop-off schedule and extend it by a half an hour or an hour, we're increasing the number of hours that they're committed to us with their drivers and their buses, which could impact the cost of their proposal to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. All set. You're all set, Mr. Bourne? Okay. Um, Ms. Minnick. I'm also concerned about the the transfer there you know right now you said there are some kids very few who ride the bus immediately after school and there are a lot of kids who can't if you switch it there will be some kids who will ride the bus late but there will be some kids who may be disadvantaged by not having a bus right after school those students who have a job after school that they need the bus to get them closer to or those students who are responsible for child care for their younger siblings or I, I don't know what other but those that's an example of just two possibilities so I mean I'm concerned if we take away and make the bus not run until four o'clock um, you know if you're a great student and you don't need to visit your teacher for help you just wasted an hour sitting on the curb well you can do your homework in the library uh, it's open Hopefully. <laughs> um, Ms. Duvall? Well, I, I want to, I mean, I do agree that with an increase in the length of the elementary school day, it's not that I personally don't agree with it. I just find it a little bit, I don't know, almost hypocritical not to go to the public with where, what would work for them. Do you want an earlier start time for the elementary for it to go? I mean, we just haven't really discussed it. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I've talked to, I talked to a principal about it, when um, Ms. Riddle, and she said that the number of hours that our elementary students stay in school are less than the average of the state. I mean, most people have more than the minimum six hours. And that, I mean, I think it'd be great to have extra time, but I think that people should be asked, just as I think that people should be asked about whether the bus, we had all these forms, whether or not a later bus would work for more people than not. Because you're not really, I mean, you may be inconveniencing and talking again about changing and shifting lifestyles and you know family things and stuff but as far as the opportunity what we have to provide is the opportunity for academic su success they can study they can do join clubs they can become more enriched at that time and from having gone through Northampton High School and had a bus that left at 302 and me walking many days because I just didn't make the bus you know or 230 I mean it, was, it ended right after and it was run or you missed it and at that time they even had rules where well if you missed the first one and you happened to be on it you were allowed to take another one because it came so darn early to accommodate everything that even if it, it dropped you off closer I mean they let you do that at the time because they understood it that there, that there was a problem at the time but I just think that that's something that needs to come out to the to the public as far as that because the Northampton High School start time I don't understand really why we have to go back to the public and say 830 versus 815 I mean because we've been discussing it all the way along I guess my, my extra question would be if a certain number of parents opposed a longer school day at the elementary level, then we wouldn't do it. Is that the point? Or? Well, no. My, you know what? I think that yes, I think that philosophically we should do it. I think that if it's good for our advantageous for our students, then we should do it. But it's the same thing as far as the um, late school start. If it's advantageous for our students, then we shan't. We should do it. We shouldn't have to. Last time, I think it was they said 60 and 60 percent were against and 40 percent were for. 40 percent of the kids at our school that could even do better than we're doing may end up being the difference between a, you know, a level two school and a level one school when he was talking about that it's only like four, four people that's that difference. I mean, we can make those changes by just going with science. Uh, Ms. Pick. I'd like just to bring, bring us back to the topic of um, the proposals um, okay. So school, school start time, and um, I, I did have some remarks, some I prepared. Um, we've been talking about this for a really long time, and we can argue about how many years we've talked about it. We can argue about how many forums we've had and all of that. I think that we have all heard all the information there is to hear. This school committee, as a whole, last January, took a unanimous vote, urging this. Superintendent, and, and thanks to Annie, I actually have the language, charging the superintendent to build a proposal to implement a school start time no earlier than 8 o'clock to be instituted in the fall of 2013 
Um, and then we added that we wanted the plan to come to a the proposal to come to us in September of 2012. I'd like to say that the superintendent did exactly what we asked him to do. We've all said that we agree with the research. Nobody is disputing anything that, that comes out of the research. We have, in the past, looked at this every which way we can, and we've never moved forward because we haven't been able to figure it out financially. When we took that vote, which was unanimous in January, it was my belief that when the superintendent devised such a plan that we were going to vote that in because that is what we said we needed to do in this district and what was best for kids. In the process of his developing this plan, I thought it was great that he, um, came, he found a way to look at this whole um, um, lengthening the day of the elementary um, schools because it's something we've been talking about. I think it's something that gets vetted in the public as an informational as informational meetings, the same way other changes that we've made. It's not everything is for the community to say, oh, we want that or we don't want that. Sometimes we get to say, this is the choice that we're making for the district and we're going to inform you and we're giving you plenty of lead time for how to think about how to implement this. Um, I, I am only going to imagine, and we'll, you know, we'll be able to hear more about that, that parents in the elementary schools might be very, very pleased because Look how many kids are taking advantage of after school programs as it is now. So I think that this is going to be more structured learning time and I think that it's going to be um, a wonderful um, addition to our programming. Um, it also allowed the, in the, the research and the, the challenges that came from the, the, um, the community, it allowed our transportation director to look at um, how we place kids on buses and it allowed us to change, um, to reduce the number of buses that we have, um, saving us some money. Um, people have come to us and said, um, we don't need to change the time because look how well we're already doing um, for AP and art, and we heard so much about that tonight. We don't have a big tardy or absentee problem. I think that we do have a tardy and absentee problem. Um, it might not be huge. I know that we can improve it. I will just tell you that my daughter would have skewed the um, statistics last week. She was absent one day, and she was tardy two days last week. Um, she has gone to bed between 11 and 2 o'clock every morning except for the one night I found her asleep on the computer at 9.15. She is staying up. She's taking a challenging course load. She is working very, very hard. She is um, staying up very late to do homework. She's getting up absurdly early um, to get ready for school. She is on the crew team, so she practices five days a week. She has regattas one day every weekend, sometimes two. At the same time, trying to interview at colleges. It is just crazy and we we all know that the majority of kids can't manage on that little sleep I'm living with it day to day right now this will not affect my kid she's a senior she's graduating I wish it would have she would tell you we shouldn't change because she thinks that this is I, I think that kids just don't understand sometimes um, what change can do for them and for the kids who say I'm happy to get up in the morning and go to school I say, great, this will give you an extra 45 minutes or whatever it is to study, to play music, to exercise, to do whatever it is that you would like to do with your 45 minutes because you are up early. It's not the majority of kids. So I just want to make sure I'm making my points here. Um, I don't think, you know, if we give them, the, those kids that time, I don't think it's we're taking anything away from them. We're giving them 45 minutes in the morning that they can, they can use. It's my belief that this committee will not be fulfilling what we said that we would do when we gave this charge to the superintendent last year if we do not vote to um, change the start time at the high school to a later time. I am um, very pleased with proposal three and I would be very happy to support that and I am, I am strongly supporting that plan. Um, it is one of the only times I can think of in my 11 years on the Council Committee where I am choosing to vote against what the ALT team is recommending. And I don't do that lately, and I don't think any of us do. We all say how um, important it is to us to work collaboratively with them and to hear what they have to say. And we, we, we have heard some of it. We know that the high school principal supports a later start time. 
and we also heard her very eloquently say last meeting that she is holding on to that K-12 perspective and wants to support her colleague in the middle school. I don't think that changing the times the way Proposal 3 is, uh, is stated is dismissing that K-12 perspective. I think it's asking us to shift a little bit it makes a negligible change at the middle school, at, at the elementary school. It makes a very significant change at the high school of 45 minutes. It makes a 15 minute change in the wrong direction for the middle school. It's still a start time that's 10 minutes later than what we do at the high school now. So the high school has been carrying this burden since we went to a three tier system. It's not that I just want to shift the burden somewhere else, but I do think that the 45 minute advantage for four years outweighs the 15 minute disadvantage for three years at the middle school. So with no disrespect intended to anybody concerned at the middle school, whether it's the administrators, the faculty, the parents, the students, I am more comfortable with that than not making a change at the high school. The only way that I would not be, the only way that I would um, support not voting on um, option number three tonight is because we decide as a group that we want to hear more about option four if that needs to be vetted further. I'm not sure how significant that 15 minutes is in making the, the day later. I do know that Nancy Athis did say a year ago, two years ago, however many times, that she thought 8.30 was too late. Um, she thought that 8.15 was as late as she wanted to go. It's, it's that much more with, the, with um, athletics, it's that much more that we have to worry about, you know, Smith College classes. Um, it's that much, you know, later, later of a day. Um, so I, I'm content with Proposal 3, but I'd be willing to hear more about Proposal 4 if that's what the, the school committee wants to say. But I will not be pleased if we say we're not going to make a change at the high school. Um, Mr. Meyer. My issue with moving the middle school students up is that the same paper that says the mid sleep point for high school students is 445 says that for a 12 year old the mid sleep point is 345. So the middle school kids are actually getting to the middle of their cycle an hour earlier. Unfortunately that doesn't help us because the sleep requirements for the 12 year old, 12 year old are 10 to 11 hours versus 8 to 9 hours. So you have more sleep. So actually, our middle school students in an ideal world would be waking up at 845. So I actually did out minute by minute going from age 11 to age 18. And again, you know, you might say if this is a linear relationship and that sleep lost always counts the same amount for each student, then I'd say, okay, we get net minutes on one side, we're good. But that's not how human development works. I mean, we know, we know that for babies, that environmental insult, insults are far worse at that age than they are developmentally later on. And when you've got the human brain 10 to 13, I don't think you can say it's the same thing. I, and I haven't had any research presented to me at all that says that's the case. What's even better is that now we have a proposal for us that the superintendent has said is possible, and I've not heard other objections programmatically that keeps the middle school where it is, that moves, that even gets more benefit for the high school students and gets educational benefit for the elementary school students as well. So uh, you know, I hope that the, respecting the process that the superintendent is able to take this forward, but I, I would say go forward, with, you know, send out number four and see, see if there's objections that would dissuade us from making the change, which I, for me that would be hard to find, but I'd like to do that tonight. So I'd like to make a motion okay, okay. to put out for discussion, okay? And we might need to tweak it a little. I'd like to make a motion that next month that we vote on either option number three or option number four. 
and that we are going to choose one of those two. That's the, that's the motion that I would put out for discussion. Okay. There's been a motion. I'll second it for the purpose of discussion. Okay. Um, that's it. I disagree. I, guess, uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree because we've just been pigeonholed into option number three or four by make, by having that motion. So I mean, I second it for the purpose of discussion. Mr. Moore. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think proposal number four is far better than proposal number three. Um, the two-tier system thing. You know, I hate to keep saying this, but I'm using numbers that have been provided by our transportation coordinator, and when I add <clears throat> numbers up. There are fewer riders than there are seats in the vans, the big yellow buses, the MPS buses. There are, I do not understand the assertion that there simply is not space. There simply is. There's, there's, there are still empty seats, even by conservative estimates, even if you say 50 students per big yellow bus instead of 55 even if you recognize that not all the high school students would be on the yellow buses until after the elementary school students were off. This is before doing that, before getting the real numbers, there's empty seats. So I've really been very frustrated with a year of being told things which I've yet to be shown the numbers. I, I have replied to these things saying, look, here's the way I add up the numbers, and I have yet to get anything other than, well, that's just not true. I would like to be shown it. It's arithmetic. I'm not a politician, but i got to say that. And the, it, it is. It's arithmetic. I've added it up. You know, I was told the vans are completely full. Well, they're completely full as long as you leave a bunch of seats empty, I guess. because. <laughs> I've been given the numbers of vans, I've been given the numbers of seats, and there are empty seats even again if you put all the high school students who ride the vans on with all the elementary school kids, there are empty seats. There are roughly 50 elementary kids who go on the vans, on these eight vans, so you know they're covering pretty much the whole city, so you're not talking about adding a lot of geographic coverage because 50 kids on eight vans in Northampton is not that big of a city. You're only, there are enough seats for the 13 high school kids on those vans because eight vans is eight seats because elementary kids don't ride in the shotgun, high school kids do. And so, so, so the point is you only need five or six more seats and guess what, you have them. You got a, more than a dozen empty seats. So what's your point? Dad? <laughs> my point is, my point is I'm really very frustrated with being told month after month after month that there are not enough seats to use two tiers for all riders. It's nonsense. There are enough seats for two but riders. We have, we have valid already said that pursuing this is I'm really fed up with okay. not being told the truth. And I feel as a member of the school committee that this is really an insult and an affront to me and to everybody else. Instead of discussing nonsense about whether or not there are or aren't when there are, we should have a meaningful discussion about things like whether or not you want to have elementary kids on the same bus with high school kids. Those are meaningful discussions and worth having. But to be essentially over and over again given numbers, which when I add, and my, my, I'm, not, I'm not a mathematician, but when I add numbers, I come up with empty seats. And I, and I and I really find this to be a problem. I'm not happy with it. I don't think the whole committee should be happy with it because these are the same numbers that you've been provided with for years. As, as Stephanie said last at our last meeting, well, we've been told for years that this is the only way to do it. And yet at the same time, we know there's only a hundred and some kids riding the high school buses. And we're told we have to have nine buses to transport them. I mean, this is, this is not good accounting. It's a waste of money. We're spending money to drive empty buses around Northampton every single day. Um, we look at money all the time. We're constantly trying to squeeze pennies out, and yet we're told there are not enough seats for two tiers when we spend, we would save, we would save $45,000 on the vans. Mr. Moore, oh, could, could I just ask? If we didn't went to two tiers, that's the vans. Could I just ask you? Would, 25,000, excuse me. Um, I just wondering, could, would you yield to one of yes. your colleagues who just wants to make a? Uh, no, I just have to apologize anymore. I have to leave, so I just didn't want to make like a quick exit out. But, um, I have to do a child care um, replacement issue here, so. Okay. Good night. Enjoy. Good night. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Did you want to make Thank some? You. 
parting remarks before you leave? Something good. <laughs> good night. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm done with a rant. I'm just, you know, yeah. had it. Mr. Bourne? I was just going to say that the superintendent said that you guys don't see eye to eye on this. I'm going to trust the superintendent on this. So it's just, I appreciate you, you know, letting us know what you think, but I'm going to trust the superintendent. It's not what I think. It's not a matter of opinion. These are the numbers which we all have access to, and they don't add up the way we're being told by the superintendent. This is not opinion. This is math. Ms. Minnick. Well, I want to respect what you said. I'm sorry that you feel that you haven't gotten appropriate information or timely information or clear-cut answers. I think there are, I think that in some respects some of what you're doing is mixing apples and oranges because I believe that some of our van transportation is really contractual for special education purposes it's only special. and it can't be mixed it, it, or not That's right. nece necessarily should not be mixed together and I think we should be, if, if we needed to, we would be debating about whether to put mixed grades, mixed levels of school students yeah. on buses or or whatever. And I appreciate also the fact that you've said that we could save some money and we're trying to squeeze every penny out. You're right, it's important. And I, I encourage you to keep trying and hopefully you will get the information that you need. However, it, but then however, we have four proposals in front of us, mm -hmm. two or three of which make sense. Yeah and could be voted on within the next month without going back and getting a lot more information from the school department. So having validated your concerns and, and you. said that, that you deserve to be frustrated, I really think we need to leave it alone because I don't see around this table any support for a two-tiered busing system. I understand that. I understand that people would rather not. So if I we don't have support. to go there, could no, we just the consider the proposals, the proposals yeah, that we have like in I front of us? I need everyone to, I need to sort of stop the crosstalk so we can, everyone has a chance to speak. So are, are you finished? Yes, I am. Okay. Is there someone else who'd like to speak, Ms. Duvall? I just wanted to say that I do, I would support a two-tier system, but um, I think that it becomes more than just, and I also do see empty buses all the time so I think but I think it's more than that I think that it would really mean going to the community and really doing an outreach program and, and I think that we need to, to make a decision and make a direction and um, the two-tier system I, I, I do I would agree with it I'd like your plan right from the beginning I'd like to say that I, I think that elementary school students and high school students can ride together I think though that it's been years in the making mm -hmm. to get the school start time, and like Ms. Minnick said, we have some that may not be ideal, but are, are pretty good on the table. But I do, I think that you've done a really good job as far as the research goes, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I would support that, so. I would like to say, it's, it's not, not really my proposal. There. I got this proposal from the mother of a Ryan Rhodes student about three years ago. There's a lot of smart people out there. Yeah, that's right. So um, <laughs> just before I recognize you, I just want to remind people there's a motion on the table. The motion on the table is that this body will um, take a vote at its next meeting between option three and option four. And I believe the assumption is that the superintendent in the intervening time will go out and do another forum on these on the two choices so people know about number four um, before we come back for that vote. So that's what's on the table. Um, is that what you that's what you need. Know you? I, I don't actually know that we need a forum on this. I don't think that it's a significant change that warrants coming out of my head. I do think it warrants hearing from, um, uh, from the high school about whether 8.30 is as viable for, as a start time for them as 8.15. Because I'm, I am remembering what Nancy um, did say about that. So that would be my concern. Okay. I, I was just reflecting what the superintendent right. had so said. I, I right. would right. ask, you know, if you wanted to comment on why you think of why we would need to vet it with the whole community to make it just a little bit later when it wouldn't change the other school significantly. It wouldn't change the middle school at all. Well, for the main reason that I think it would be fair, and it only takes me 90 minutes one night to do it, and that's 90 minutes well spent. So you would hold one form at the high school for high school parents about whether for the public anybody or but mm -hmm. primarily it would be for for people who are involved in the high school to say whether 8:15 rather than 8:30 and ending at 2:45 uh, rather yeah. than three o'clock. Right, 
then I would also take, in addition to the forum, I would take it specifically to the high school faculty to talk to them about it. Yeah. Okay. So I, um, Mr. Bourne had his hand up before I, and then Mrs. Minnick. I'm not sure if this is exactly what Stephanie meant, but I'd be willing to say that, that at the next meeting I'd be willing to vote for an earlier start time. It's just a matter of which of these two proposals it's going to be. Later start time? I mean, a later start time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not that we're going to vote on these for an two proposals and see which one, but to say that we're going to change the start time, it's a matter of which of these two proposals it's going to be. That's what I would, I do, would be ready to do. Ms. Minnick. Um, is there any support for proposal number two? Was there any? No. And, and I, I want to say that I said at our last meeting that I would support proposal when we didn't have a number four, when we were still looking at one, two, and three. I said I would have supported number two except for the fact that the elementary school started so late. And it never occurred to me, nor was it ever was the issue ever raised, that there are possibilities for a before school program that would deal with that late start time for elementary school. If people thought that there were a possibility for that, is anybody interested in number two or is that really a non starter? In which case Stephanie's motion makes sense. That's I guess what I'm asking is just for a straw poll if there's any support for number two. Not for me. I would say for number two just there already is a before school program people pay for it and people complain to me about how they have to pay for it already with a nine o'clock start so you know I don't you know that, that's why I don't look at it as a positive did that satisfy your mm -hmm. inquiry okay so should we call the question okay I have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do have a little bit of a concern with um, taking proposal number one off the table um, I'm not a I'm not a hundred percent proponent of proposal number one, but I would say that now when we look at proposal number four, changing um, the elementary school from 8:50 to nine o'clock, I have met with parents, and any change that moved later into the morning was going to be um, a little burdensome, and so I do appreciate the superintendent saying give the public an opportunity to come out and be heard and to speak. And I'll go back to what Mr. Ball said as well, that uh, you know the elementary schools may not be aware of the change on the later end of the afternoon. And certainly uh, they may not be uh, uh, aware of the 10, for the 10 minute uh, change as well later into the morning. Uh, I know when I spoke to parents several years ago, any change um, from the nine to five schedule of the working parent um, that they were already stressed out with because they were just making the time now, um, that 10 minutes could be a difference to them. And I think that it's worth uh, letting them hear about it and having an opportunity to come out and comment on it. Um, I'm also still concerned about the, um, the athletics in the afternoon. I did see um, uh, the athletic director a few weeks ago here at a parent, uh, at no, an open house, and he uh, did mention after watching the school committee and shifting the the afternoon uh, uh, release for the high school uh, later into the afternoon that uh, I, I do believe I heard from him that he thought it was gonna be problematic and that he was going to talk to the superintendent about it. Um, I don't know if he has or not. So I do think that giving the superintendent an opportunity to hold one more forum, have the athletic director, have parents come, anybody that would like to hear and talk about it certainly would um, be beneficial and would be the way to go and that's what I would support but I, I, I cannot support taking um, proposal number one off or even number two off because I agree with you that if we look at proposal number two it's academically sound and probably the the most on most of the levels and uh, if we're saying that 920 start time is too much for elementary school parents then our are we saying that um, a nine o'clock start time isn't? And I think it just, it's worth hearing from, it's worth hearing from parents. Mr. Self. Um, I, I agree with the, the idea, I've said it more than once, that I don't think enough people know about some of the changes that we're talking about. Um, I think it's been, uh, it's become known as a school, as a high school start time issue, and it's really not, it's a district-wide issue, so I would really support the idea of having another forum to vet number four. Um, I think there are probably people out there watching and, and 
jumping through the television saying, I can't believe they're still talking about this. <laughs> um, hasn't this been settled? But I don't think these are insignificant issues, and these are the things that we have to consider. Um, I know that, that people have talked about how other schools have been able to make this change, so how come we have it? Um, I happen to work in a school that a couple of years ago made it made it its change its start time, went from 8 to 8.30. Uh, we were able to do it because we didn't have to worry about busing. We didn't have to worry about um, the middle school because we just changed the middle school too. So uh, I just want to I just want to say that that I think this is a healthy discussion to have, and I think we need it. Granted, I'm new to the party. I've only been worried about this for you know 10 months now, but I, I think it's a good thing to have. Um, the other thing I want to mention that I, I got a little bit concerned about, and it, it also struck me when when I saw the great heard about the great AP numbers. Uh, we're hearing about the, the dire things that, that are happening because the start time at the high school is so early. And, and I'm not disputing the, the, the science on it at all, but I'm just a little bit concerned that a later start time won't be able to deliver on all the promises that people think are going to be wrapped up with it. I mean, we've heard everything from um, uh, we're going to be safer on the streets when, when people are driving to it's, it's somehow going to alleviate people's ADD symptoms and and I don't mean to belittle that at all I'm just saying that based on my experience when I was at a school where the start time changed yes we did see improvement in some areas but we didn't see skyrocketing test scores we didn't see it wasn't like the coca-cola commercial where everyone's hugging all the time because everyone's so happy you know things do improve but I think I, I just have to temper that um, all of that said I do support the motion on the table to say yes at our next meeting we're going to vote for one of these uh, I am still uncomfortable with the idea of saying uh, that we want the middle schoolers to take one for the team, so to speak, because I think that's um, just just continuing what we're all recognizing is as a is a bad practice. So I just wanted to put that up there. So uh, we have a motion on the table. The motion on the table is that at its next meeting, the school committee will, will take a vote on a, uh, a choice between option three or option four. I have a question on that. What if he comes back and, and Brian com uh, comes back and says, well, this all got brought up, and I mean, are we, like, tough, vote or not? Because I think that it's, you know, like Mr. Sheffel said, people turn in and say, oh, you're still talking about it, but this is a really important issue to work out all the details and the fine, you know, it's a, it's a perfect time to get it right. Um, I would like to think that we could also discuss um, at the forum a later bus time for the high school, you know, I mean, how people felt about just moving the bus and having kids just be there, because they're old enough to be there. Yeah, I'm going to look into that, that anyway. You know, but, but, yeah. but my concern with saying we have to vote on it is what if it's not right? I mean, do we still have to vote on it? So much for my battery. Well, I, I mean, think what if you what if the superintendent comes back and says, "Look, we have these issues, and there's more problems, or there's more questions, <laughs> or look, it opened this door and you didn't know it." I mean, I'm totally for changing the start time, mm -hmm. but I one I think that we should do it with people too. I think we should check to see about the um, a late bus and whether or not that is a priority for the high school students, and three to really make sure the elementary school, you know that they're okay with the start with the start and the end time. And I don't I mean I don't have a problem with the start time because I think a couple of years ago it was kinda of nine o'clock at this point I was just at the school right? yeah, I think so. uh, <laughs> I think if you're uncomfortable with that choice then the option is to just not support the motion tonight. But that's Okay, that's, that's my question. Uh, yeah. Ms. Minnick? Um I think I probably am not in favor of the motion only because I don't like being locked into three or four. And I don't like being locked into next month. I'm, I think I'm in favor of changing the start. I think I could vote for number four without problem, but I really don't want to be tied down to that, so I probably will vote no against Stephanie's motion. However, I would like to make a special request also that as the superintendent is taking this to a forum and getting all the other information, that he actually bring us a, a recommendation or a, uh, a sense of what the administrative leadership team thinks about it for the simple reason that I, I like I, I don't know for sure but I'd like to say that their that their um, opposition to the the to having any change was because they were trying to maintain the the k-12 um, philosophy and not disadvantage one group of students to ad to provide benefit for another, and I'd like to see if they believe that the 10-minute disadvantage later 
to um, elementary students is of the same sort of uh, effect or impact that a 15 minute earlier start time was for the middle school students. I'm, my guess is they will say it's not the same and I hope that they could support, but I would like to know what their feeling is on number four. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bourne. I was just going to say, I think one concern is how long we just let this drag on for if we don't vote next month. I mean, are we still going to be kind of going through this six months from now? I mean, that's that's the reason to say we're going to we're going to take care of this one way or the other next month, and that's going to be it. Let's get it. Um, and so um, I, and the, other, the, other, the other thing I want to say is I think we have a forum. We really need to think about how we get good participation because oftentimes we do these forums on 35 people show up, and um, it's just, they sound great, but the, you don't get, you don't really get the word out in a, in a productive way, so. Didn't, didn't we hire somebody to do PR for the district? Can't we write a press release somewhere? We didn't hire somebody <laughs> for the <laughs> 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 district. Yeah. So, um, so I have a number of hands, uh, Mr. Meyer, then Ms. Pick. Well, I, I understand, um, the motion's intent to to bring this to a conclusion. However, I would believe that even if we voted no on three and four at the next meeting, that any member could make a motion and have it seconded to move another proposal forward. I mean, we're not, we're not, we can't tie our hands. So in that respect, I would say let the superintendent go and vet the proposals that we have suggested and bring back to us the full slate. Because again, if we if we want to have number one, we could vote no on number two, no on number three, and then since we've already decided that extending the elementary school day is a good idea, number one is there by default. So I I'm, I would vote against the motion, just because I don't think it could be effective in in bringing about what it's trying to bring about. The only way that we can not uh, confront this is for whenever someone makes a motion about start time, for nobody to second it. <laughs> And with this group, that will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, return to the maker of the motion. Um, if I were home, I wouldn't be jumping through my TV. I would have thrown it out the window a long time ago. <laughs> uh, if I had had my druthers, I would have. I would. I would be asking for a vote on proposal number three tonight and being done with this tonight because I think that we have vetted out as as almost as much as we possibly could. And I'm fine with three. I don't think that proposal one should even be on the table because it doesn't do what we asked the superintendent to do. We, as a group, decided unanimously that we wanted to change the start time at the high school to a later time. Proposal number one does not do that. I would not vote for proposal number two because I, I think that the elementary time is way too late at 920, no matter what we come up with before that. And getting out at 10 of 4 for an elementary school student, I think, is absurdly late. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just too long a day for them because they are up early in the morning. So to me, those two are off the table, and that's why I came up with the motion that I came up with. Um, so, like I said, in spite of the fact that it pushes our middle school students up by 15 minutes, I am in complete support of proposal number three and would vote on it tonight. I am really concerned about how wishy-washy this committee is getting. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. We're, we're asking a lot of important questions, but we've been asking them for years. And we've gotten the answers. And you know, the, whether or not we have a late bus at the high school isn't really part of this proposal. That's something that we can look at after we take this vote. I actually don't like proposal number four, but if people feel, I, I made the motion that I made because I felt like if people felt strongly that they wanted to hear more about it, that we should. I think, I, I think that Pushing the elementary school even that much later is hard. If you have a job in Northampton that starts at 9 o'clock, you want to drop your kids off before that time. Um, I, I, I think that's a hard time for the elementary. And um, again, I, um, I, I'm thinking that 8.30 is going to be too late in terms of what happens at Smith College and what happens for sports. And I think that the principal said that that, that was too late. If I were going to put a different motion on the table, I'd say I'd vote on number three right now, but I don't think that, that we have that vote, so I'm not going to do that. You if somebody wants me, I don't think that we, I don't think that it would pass. And um, I, I really don't even understand why we're, why all of these are still on the table. I'd like to at least reduce it somehow, and I'd be happy to find some way to do that tonight. Mm -hmm. I will take, I will 
rework my motion if that's what we need to do, but I don't want to be looking at something that's not making the high school time later when we have proposals that allow us to do that. That's not what we told the community that we would do. It's not what we asked the, the superintendent to spend all this time on. And in the meantime, he has spent an inordinate amount of time on this over his, during his first year when this was not his priority. Look at the amount of time that we have spent on that when we have so many really other important things that we need to be getting to. I, I really think it's time to bring this to a close. I'm willing to go one more month. I'm not willing to go more than that. I, I just don't think that we're going to learn anything that vital that is worth going more than that. I don't even want to go one more month. Okay, so um, Mr. Moore. Um, yeah. Uh, I just want to point out that in June, we were at a forum where there was enough room on the yellow buses for all the students. The problem was there wasn't enough space on the vans. I got the van numbers a few weeks later, it took two weeks to get those numbers, and discovered, lo and behold, there was enough room on the vans. And yes, they're a separate population, but there's enough room on the vans for them. Now I find out again on this thing, there's not enough room on the buses several months later. Well, there was enough in June, okay? So that's my first problem with that. Second thing. With the two-tier proposal, everybody's saying they're worried about the elementary schools being too late. With the two-tier proposal, the elementary schools go first at a time like 8, 10, or 8, 15. The high school goes after at a time 10 or 15 minutes later. And the JFK goes roughly half an hour after that. It puts all the start times between 8 and 9, nobody before 8, nobody after 9. It puts the high school at 8, 15, or 8, 20, or 8, 30 which is all within the range of what we've been talking about. You know, it, it, I, it, I'm going to really support number four because apparently everybody else doesn't think the two-tier thing is, but it's interesting. All the objections to all the things that are on our current list of four are answered by the two tiers, including cost. It costs less because it's two tiers instead of three. You know, the, the the phenomenal thing is that somehow or other we can't do that. When you're talking about the committee being wishy-washy, yeah, you know, that's the interesting thing. We're complaining about stuff. The answer to those complaints is in front of us, but we can't do it because we've been told we don't have enough seats, except we were also told we did have enough seats in June. So, you know, all in all, I find this to be a very frustrating part of this discussion. Um, does anybody else have anything else they need to say before I just call the question on well, we can just actually, we can... Because otherwise I'd like to call the question. Well, I just wanted to say that, that it doesn't necessarily have to mean wishy-washy. To prolong it doesn't, I mean, mm. we have to have the right answer. I would be willing to vote on three or four tonight also, but the superintendent says that he wants more time to discuss it, and I think the elementary schools would definitely have time, you know, discuss what's best mm. for them. I do agree with... Miss Pick, though, that number one is non-responsive. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't make a change. We did unanimously decide to make a change, and I think that we should stick with that. And I think right now the two-tier system is just, is just so dead. So I don't understand why, so, because it answers everybody's objections. So why don't, we, um, why don't we vote on the motion that's on the table, see, and then see what happens from there, and then we can talk about other, no. Ms. Minnick. I'm, I'm concerned about something that I've heard said several times here. I do not believe that we unanimously said that we wanted to make a change and instructed him to bring us a proposal that would work. I believe that we said for him to bring us a proposal and we didn't say make it happen because we wanted to see the proposal and have the opportunity to make a decision one way or the other that could have meant not doing it at all which is proposal number one. So, I, I, and I could be all wrong, but my recollection of our vote is not that we said, we're definitely making a change, just come bring us a proposal. It's, we'd like to make a change, but we want to know how we can do it. Please bring us a proposal. You have a piece of paper in front of you. So just say it. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I have a question of just whether or not, if, if we do vote positively, affirmative for her, and next month, um, superintendent comes back and says, oh my gosh, we need one more month because of such and such. Have we blocked ourselves into having to vote for it next month? I, I mean, those are just there, uh, yeah. As, um, 
can always be another question. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Oh, and and uh, you know, three and four could both get voted down, and then you'd be back to the drawing board of deciding what to do next. So, yeah, it does not. Um, it's, okay. it's not as binding as. Not uh, as binding. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the the motion on the table again is that uh, the, that at the next meeting the the committee will um, the choices will be narrowed between option three and option four, and the committee will take a vote between those two options. Um, so all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Uh, um, Actually, I'm going to call, ask for a roll call vote on that, just because it's uh, it's late. Howard <laughs> Moore? Aye. Stephen Peck? Yes. Mr. Andrew Shelfo? Yes. Mr. Ed Zahowski? No. Mr. David Narkway? Yes. Mr. Albert Moore? Yes. Mr. Michael Ball? Yes. Mr. Michael Flynn? Mr. Downey Meyer? Aye. Please a minute. No. Okay. So, uh, so we'll uh, be back next month, and we will uh, revisit the issue next month. We make um, a motion to extend our meeting until 1:15. All those in favor of extending the meeting, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. I would like to restate the task to make sure I understand what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. So my understanding is that we are only looking at Proposal 3 and Proposal 4, and I'm going to uh, look at the details of these two plans, offer a public forum for the public of any level to come and weigh in on this, and also take it to the high school, to the faculty specifically, and the administration. In addition to taking it to the high school, I'll take it to ALT and get their opinion on it once again and be back next month with that information. A little ALT worse for wear, but yeah. back again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, <laughs> the. Um, the next item on the agenda is a gift. Uh, this is from the Northampton High School class of 1952 um, and requires a vote uh, for the uh, school department to accept the gift. Um, Mr. McLaughlin, uh, do, would you like to, you're, you're noted on here as describing this. Um, I'll just read it um, <clears throat> for, the, for the record. The class of 1952 is celebrating their 60th anniversary reunion. They've approached us with a gift donation from their class for Northampton High School. The gift is a U.S. flag on a pole with stand for the auditorium stage. The flag is complete, made in America. It is three feet by five feet on an eight foot high solid oak pole. It costs approximately $400. Thank you, So there's been a motion okay. made and seconded. Mrs. Minnick. Um, with our gratitude <laughs> to, to accept their gift. And um, I'd like to jump in here and make a motion that we suspend our rules to continue meeting for another 20 minutes. We, we just, we just voted on that. <laughs> yeah. you, you actually voted to do that? No, I didn't. I did not. Okay. I'm sorry. I did not do that. At all. We, we motioned, we seconded, we voted. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm so, um, so then there's been a motion made and seconded to accept this generous <laughs> gift from the class of 1952. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, the next item is a gift from the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts. Uh, and again, I will um, ask the business manager to describe this gift. Um, and again, I'll read it for public benefit and for the committee. It is uh, a pleasure to enclose a check for $7,000 to the Northampton School Department restricted to the Northampton High School Studio Theater Project, commonly known as the Black Box Theater. Uh, this grant is from the Community Foundation of Western Mass on the recommendation of an anonymous donor. I move the accept Second. Okay. Is there any discussion of this gift? Okay. So all those in. Uh, Do we accept restrictive gifts? 
Uh, most certainly we can. Yes. Good answer. Um, you, you have the option to say no, but we, you know, we accept NAF grants that are, you know, awarded for certain things. Ms. Minnick. Just out of curiosity, I assume that superintendent or his designee is sending a thank you letter to these folks for their gifts. Of course. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the gifts, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent evaluation criteria and evidence. So the um, superintendent evaluation committee has met several more times since um, we spoke with you last, uh, twice, twice since our last meeting. If you remember at the last meeting, I told you that we were going to be discussing which of the 10 um, elements from the rubric we would be choosing um, uh, for evaluation purposes for next year. And I um, offered to any of you to connect with any of us on the committee if you had any questions or concerns or thoughts based on um, um, the last round of evaluation. Um, we did not hear from any of you. But we did go through, um, uh, through this with the superintendent over two meetings, and we have chosen um, 10 elements. Um, I believe seven of them are the same um, that we used this year, and three of them are new. Um, you have in your packet, did, you get that, did they get the highlighted rubric? They do. They do. They have uh, they, they rubric, all, oh, the rubric, highlighted all. No, the extra additional blue folder. Uh, with, the, uh, with the 10 elements highlighted of um, the ones that we chose for this year. Because of the hour, I'm not going to go into um, any specifics about which ones we chose and why and all the rest of it, but we thought that um, this was more well rounded and thought that some of ours um, from last time might have been a little bit redundant. So we, we did a good job. And, and, and this was the three of us meeting with so the superintendent, and we chose these the together. Right. Yeah, the next evaluation. <laughs> we have a date. <laughs> we, I mean, we, we know it was going to be accelerated from this year. We're going to try and move it forward, right? It had to be You should do the evaluation in April, yeah. read it into the record in May, so that any so changes to the contract would be in place by July 1st. So you can take a look at these 10 highlighted elements and um, be paying attention to them over the course of the year. We also should be doing it in the spring because I, I don't know about with this particular con I'm just in general we have to let someone know if we're not renewing a contract so we have to be doing it in a timely fashion right. to know whether the evaluation says we're not renewing. Right. Um, in not, addition, not sure, but after that. <laughs> similarly to um, everybody who's going to be using the new evaluation tool superintendent um, needed to write to SMART goals um, that, that we would also be using in this evaluation. Um, we, he, everybody needs to choose one for, for professional practice and one that has to do with student learning. The superintendent wrote two um, under each category. We have discussed them at length. They have been <coughs> written and reworked um, to the point where you have this in your packet as well today. Um, the um, evaluation committee um, has discussed these at length and we are uh, we have ones that we want to recommend but we thought that it was most appropriate since this is new um, for you to see what all of them are um, so um, under professional practice the first one has to do with something that came up through the um, um, evaluation um, process that we did this year, um, which was about building relationships with the business community and advocating for um, for funds and um, not, not just monies but resources from from our business community Support. and developing a a, um, a more collaborative relationship with our business community um, in and around Northampton. Um, and the second choice um, has to do with. Um, you know, a, a, a commitment to um, observing principal practice um, for the purpose of mentoring and guiding. And um, the goal is to have um, three observations of each principal um, on a quarterly basis um, 
which is more than what has been done in the past. These are both goals that, that the superintendent is going to um, be working toward anyway, but we need to choose um, one with him as a SMART goal. Under student learning, and I'll just go through all of them and then we can open it up a little bit, but probably maybe not too much tonight based on the hour. Under student learning, one is more um, specific and has to do with something that we heard some about tonight. One has to do with um, um, getting Bridge, helping Bridge Street School um, um, with um, getting out of the, the um, level three status, all of that's not a specific part of the goal. And it says that um, by May of 2013, all students at Bridge Street who received a warning or needs improvement on their third grade math MCAS will increase their performance by at least 10% during the fourth grade. And it speaks about how that will be measured. Um, and we talked about number of students that this would, you know, that, that are being targeted, and there's a very specific plan in place for um, how um, Bridge Street School is going to address um, that goal. The second goal was a little bit um, broader, and it said by May of 2013, 80% of all students in the fifth and sixth grade will receive standards-based mathematics instruction with an inclusion setting through a co-teaching model, and that was about um, increasing or I should say um, decreasing the amount of, t of pull out time and increasing the amount of inclusion time at those two levels. And both, again, both of these things are being uh, looked at and worked on, but one has to be chosen as a SMART goal. And I would ask the superintendent if, um, how, if you want this decided tonight or if you want to hear back from people after they've had a chance to think about it next meeting, given the hour, you know, what would be your pleasure on that one? Well, the recommendation of the committee was that uh, we would look at A in both categories. That was the recommendation. And if you would like to vote that tonight, um, you know that you could probably easily do that. If you want everyone to look at it, think about it, talk about it, and come back next month, you can do that. So the three of us with the superintendent do recommend um, um, the, the first of those two um, goals in each category. If the committee would be comfortable in voting that recommendation without a lot of discussion, we can do that tonight. Yeah, I have a, Mr. Moore? Yeah, I have a question. I, I was under the understanding when we got the whole scheme of evaluation presented to us a year ago that, that, this, that the goals would be your goals, that really that wouldn't require us to, uh, you know, the, the individual teachers, for example, would present, you know, figure out their goals. Right. That you know, when there wouldn't be somebody then telling them that those goals weren't their goals. These are not for a vote. That's what I was going to say. So it's not something for us to vote on the goals. But, but I just got presented as though we were going to vote mm -hmm. tonight. We, as a group, felt that we weren't necessarily right. charged with doing this without feedback from the whole committee. This model is similar to what a teacher would undertake with a with a school mm -hmm. principal. That's right. So if we think of ourselves as a principal and mm -hmm. uh, you know superintendent as our our pupil, then. It, our, 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 I mean, lead yeah, teacher. The <laughs> the and you know, I think that's the model that we're trying. So to we're not follow. voting on it, right? And so I, as a professional, will go to my my principal with my my smart goals and tell him those things that I'm working on, and then he'll he'll measure me on my like, portfolio. What are here. you thinking? <laughs> right. And so I think it, that's kind of mm -hmm. the model we're following. Right. So uh, so I'm thinking we don't right. need to vote on this ever. Actually, we can present it with it. To decide on these with, with the superintendent, and therefore we brought it back for some to see how y'all So, um, in other words, a, a principal the superintendent works with the principal, the principal works with the teachers, mm -hmm. he works with us as a committee or us as a group that was clear to us, and that's why we came back tonight. We were hoping to be able to vote on the first of each of, um, of these but we didn't know where it would go. Um, so I, I, I would entertain a motion. I said that wrong. OK. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, question. there doesn't need to be a motion okay. if we're all in we're consensus then. OK. Yeah, you're okay. comfortable with the, with the committee working with the superintendent. OK. So does anybody not agree with A and A? I don't agree with A and A. I, I mean, think he's A and do all this stuff, so it's not. Yeah, I know. I just think that B for the student learning is because um, it's it's it includes all the kids, and I also think it's kind of a loftier goal. It's more difficult. 
what the committee discussed, because we did have that discussion, mm -hmm. that one being more um, general than the other, mm -hmm. is that A is actually a, an imperative for the district right now. Right, so why not concentrate on B? Because A has to be done. Because we have to. <laughs> That's what we're all going to do. Why don't we do the make the superintendent everybody, we have? We would be making everybody be better. Because we have, we have to. A has to be done anyway. I thought that was something I graded on. You don't have a choice there. So I think that B should be the goal. Okay, so um, uh, are there other comments about this? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how you wish to proceed. The committee, you set up a committee I, I to do we, this evaluation. If the group is, is comfortable with the committee working this through with the superintendent. I'm not. Okay. And Mr. Well, actually, I think all we can do, since again, with the goals anyway, and maybe not with the evaluation criteria, but with the SMART goals, it seems like all we could do would be sort of to converse so that what you said would be considered by Brian as he decides what his goals are going to be. But it's pretty much, as I understand the process, it's the person saying what their goals are going to be. And then, as, and, 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 you know, on an individual basis, it's not the principal telling the teacher or the superintendent telling the principal. It's the principal telling the right. superintendent what their goal is. That's what I always understood. But it just has to be clarified so we right. know what all, the goals are. Right. So. All four of these are goals of mine. You just get to grade me on only two of them, not all four of them. <laughs> so. Two of them are part of the evaluation yeah. process for next year. Well, see, that's why I think B would be more, uh, would be better to, to grade you on than A. Or should we do a straw poll? Well, I like what it would be. We've got to make a motion that we evaluate the superintendent on A and A. Let's take a vote. That's fine. Perfect. Right. We're just, what we're really wanting to hear it's is... An, it could be a non-binding non-binding resolution. Yeah. <laughs> we're just going around and say what we think are the best goals for him. That's a good idea. Alden, what do you think? I would say A and A. I like A and A. <laughs> I like B and B. I like A and B because if you would be in B too, you get 80% of all right students. <laughs> if you're doing 80% of all students and it's going to include the Bridge Street School in math, I mean, at least in the fifth grade level. <laughs> I think it's with more inclusive. I, I, I support the committee and the <laughs> superintendent's <laughs> recommendation, A and A. I'm one of the, I'm happy to support A and A, but I'm one of the ones who wanted to bring it to you, only not so much to get everybody else's opinion, but so that you could see the level of commitment that our superintendent has and he's already said that he is going to do all four of these. It's just a matter of which two he gets graded on. So I really think that we, um, I, you can use whatever sports metaphor you like. This was a home run. He's a, a touchdown. We, <laughs> 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 he's, he's uh, you know, an ace. I think we, I think we are very lucky to have a superintendent of this caliber. I'm going to interrupt to make another motion that we need to extend. Second. I, you extended it till 1130. I said 1150. Well, we have a minute, so okay, go ahead. <laughs> How long is your manager's report going to be? Business manager's report going to be? I would just extend it to 1130. <laughs> no later than 1130. Okay, so there's been a motion made to extend the meeting to 1130. Is there a second? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, Mr. Meyer. A and A. I okay. Think a and a wins. <laughs> okay. So the sense so, of the committee as is. As Lisa said, this was really about bringing you into the process. The superintendent has been very, very thoughtful. He has heard all the feedback that came through the evaluation process. These are, he, he brought back more choices than he needed to. He didn't do himself a favor <laughs> by doing that. Um, but what I'm what I'm hearing is that the majority of people seem comfortable with what he is choosing. They're all nice goals. They're so all good goals. I'd just rather grade them on video. Okay, so now we'll move on to the business manager's report. What is the executive summary version? Yep. Wait, wait, wait. wait. No. <laughs> Do we have money? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> okay. Um, are, there, are there any questions concerning the business manager's report that was in your packet? I, I would just say in regards to the nutrition guidelines, my concern more was about spending and whether or not we were on target with our spending and not so much the nutritional 
report because I do understand that the guidelines that are in place require us to serve food differently than we did before. I just wanted to know is that becoming uh, more difficult to to pay for? That's all. Uh, with with the uh, with the vegetables and, and more vegetables and um, uh, you know uh, more fruits. Uh, the answer, the general answer to that is yes. I'd like to see Carol present this with last year's numbers versus this year's number. I know it's preliminary, but maybe by December or January she could come and Oh, I was expect, just to come. You know, in January, yeah, because then we'd be able to have three or four months right. under our belt sure. to make the comparison. Right. But you needed to see this because these these instructions here and these guidelines are so difficult to meet and obtain right now. They're redoing everything from scratch because if you can see one ounce, two ounces of meat, one ounce, a half a cup, and the equivalent values. Uh, this is a whole new learning experience for everybody in food service to try to reach and meet these guidelines. That's why you have them presented in a couple different ways to you. Uh, so you see what they're working with and how they have to work in the calorie intake and the minimums and the maximums in the mixes of everything there. Uh, Mr. Moore, oh, sorry. I believe the, we talked about this before, too, but am I, am, I want to make sure this is, is this really true that we actually have to put food on trays even if the child says they will not eat it? Correct. And then throw it away? Yes. Uh, what they do with it after they leave the line is they, they've paid for that in whatever form uh, it comes to either free lunches or a paid lunch. Uh, that's how we, we have to diligently serve the food what and what they do with it afterwards is is the students uh, option okay any other questions um, I, regarding the uh, mr. I'm sorry I, I, want, I need to speak up in there too because um, mr. Skowski asked a question about athletics and food service and I believe deserves an answer before January and I thought we had talked about having uh, the athletic director and food service director to make a presentation, at least to budget and property prior to that time. I think we should review the numbers sooner than I thought, January. I thought we did yeah. discuss that and we were right. going to do that in right. budget and property coming up whenever the meetings yeah. were decided. Right. Separate so meetings, I think that we decided separate, separate meetings, meetings for both, right. yeah. not to infringe upon the time. Right. You're going to get an okay. answer sooner and more details on that. And, okay. and I know, again, speaking that about our committee here, that you know what we hear in budget and property subcommittee, we might want to have a larger discussion at, mm -hmm. a, at a full committee. So there's been some, you know, change of practice of whether or not things get sent to subcommittee versus having uh, the, you know, the have, have the mm -hmm. have that issue come before mm -hmm. the entire committee. So uh, I don't know which way you want to go with it, but I would like to get a report at some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I yes. just had a question on um, the new requirements K through 12. Um, the three quarter cup to one cup, it's right up the top corner. And then it said, no, students are allowed to select half a cup of fruit or vegetable under OVS. Uh, so because there's six pages, what page are you on? First page, right here. I just want to know I mean, is there choice that they have choice so that there's less thrown away? And are we seeing if there's more being thrown away? I recommend based on time. This is a discussion that I mean, it's, it's just a, it's just important. I think the whole diet thing is important, and we need to hear from Carol. But I don't think we have the time to go into the details because I would have a, a lot of questions about it. So we are going to have a presentation, though, at some point. Are from, they allowed to select or not? From it's all just no. a quick question. No. Okay. Right. Okay. So, any other questions about the business manager's report? No. Okay. Personnel report. Uh, You've, that's also included. Are there any questions about the personnel report that's included? Okay. Hearing none, I will ask the um, superintendent to deliver his report. Momentarily lost it. <laughs> All right. Given the fact that I am not a teenager and I am not experiencing an energy surge, <laughs> I will give you the highlights of the highlights. Uh, uh, our highlights this uh, month were focused on academic challenge in our classrooms. And so, though I have many, I'm going to post them online and just give you a few right now. Uh, at Bridge Street School, Mr. Dion's fifth grade class recently studied the Constitution of the United States of America. The class learned all about how the Constitution came about and the events of the Constitutional Convention in May of 1787. 
After reading the preamble to the Constitution, the class decided to take on the challenge of rewriting the preamble so it would make sense to any fifth grader who wanted to read it. Over at Ryan Road, uh, fifth graders in Mr. Greg Kerstetler's class uh, decided together to measure the radius of a flower head and then use the formula for the area of a circle that they had learned in math to find the area of the head in square inches. And then they would estimate the number of seeds in the sunflower uh, how many seeds would be there and then count it to find out if they were accurate. After approaching the puzzle, they began to ask, what is pi anyway? Where did it come from? The lesson went into uh, the history of pi. At Leeds School, Becky Lai, a Smith College student, will be working with Leeds School Kindergarten Classroom this fall. She's going to work with the kids on the chemistry of color and they will do experiments into the chemical concepts of separating colors using paper chromatography to separate individ individual colors into natural and artificial dyes. That's our elementary school kids. And uh, moving rather quickly, in, uh, at JFK in grade eight, uh, the Carbon Night Science recently uh, recently did model building exercises pertaining to plate tectonics and earthquakes and that will culminate in a design challenge where student teams are tasked with constructing a multi-story building that can withstand a simulated high magnitude earthquake. Knowledge of modern engineering gained in this activity will support investigations of how humans and modern society are impacted by other natural disasters experienced regionally and over the world. Finally, you glad I'm going. At the high school, Trish Armstrong in wellness has students studying lifestyle factors that promote health, disease prevention, happiness, quality of life, and longevity. Uh, they compared the lifestyles of people 50 years ago and 100 years ago to the modern American lifestyle, looking at contributing, contributing factors such as how we eat, exercise, and work. For their projects, the students are conducting wellness interviews with their teachers and their superintendent. And uh, we're invited to assess our level of wellness, provide support in areas where needed. Uh, a couple of announcements this week. Uh, Mark McLaughlin, Lori Farkas, Pam Plummer, Kelly Knight, and myself attended the annual school legal issues workshop uh, sponsored by the Collaborative for Educational Services. And I want to remind the school committee and the general public who are still with us that on October 24th, we will have our first all district two hour late start for teachers to work in their professional learning communities. And because you know, we've done this at the high school last year, now we'll be district wide, I will be doing a Connect Ed call to remind families on Monday the 22nd. Uh, so they will be aware. That's all for the superintendent report tonight. Did you mean to miss Jackson Street, or did they not have anything? I gave you the highlights of the highlights. Okay. <laughs> I'll post the rest. <laughs> Okay, so that concludes the superintendent report. The next we have a report on the superintendent's contract. So I am um, very pleased to um, report out from executive session that we have um, um, voted um, a mm -hmm. amendment to the superintendent's contract for next year. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so the, the language of the contract remains the same except for um, um, this amendment. Um, in terms of salary, we are, um, we have agreed to increase the salary by 2% for the next year. In addition, we are granting an additional stipend for professional development. This is a one-time non-recurring expense. Um, we, um, I will reiterate publicly to the superintendent that um, we gave him a very, very favorable um, evaluation, and um, what we are able to offer in, in addition to what we are able to offer anyone in your district is not necessarily a reflection of our esteem, um, but this is what we felt we were able to do, and the superintendent has agreed to this, um, and I appreciate and thank him for that. Thank you. I appreciate it, too. I, and I... I um, I guess I, I know we just discussed this quietly, but I'm, I really firmly believe that we need to take a vote on this in open session. Um, so I, I, I guess I, when we discussed this, I assumed there'd be a discussion of it in, in there, 
in executive session, but then we take a vote on it in an open session. According to our attorney, that was not necessary, but it does no harm. We can, we, we can, but I, I don't see the purpose of it. We were, we were advised that we did not need to do that. I, I cannot believe that would be, but I, you know, I wasn't privy to that, but I just know that. I had a long discussion okay. with our attorney who said this is, um, this is an amendment to a contract that gets voted in executive session, but um, it needs to be reported out in a full meeting. I'd like to, I'd, I'd, I think we should vote on it. I'd like to make a motion that we um, amend the contract to include the language that you just recited. Second. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, just to discuss it, I, I, I didn't have an opportunity to talk about the, this. I just, I, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the, the South Hadley School Board got in very big trouble for renegotiating a contract with a superintendent in executive session and not voting we didn't on it. Renegotiate no. a contract. Okay, but you. Uh, but we they, made an you, amendment that was actually part of the original contract yeah. that we would okay. um, discuss um, uh, compensation for okay. next year. But that's all. It, we, okay. we did not rewrite any of. But we ex we changed the terms of the contract. No, we we didn't actually. We so we did the, ori so the original we contract. The original contract states okay. that we that that all that oh. just we will negotiate a salary and compensation for the outgoing years. Okay, I, I don't think there is any harm in voting on it in open session. I don't think there's any harm well, to do that. So, if that's the case, I'd like just to make one comment under the discussion, um, because um, I didn't vote for it, but I thought right. something else should have been more favorable, and that's what I wanted to say okay. in open. Meeting, that it wasn't that I thought that he shouldn't receive this. I thought it should have been a better, a different package. Okay. So uh, there's been a motion made and seconded to uh, ratify the, the agreed upon. Our lawyer is looking very pensive. No, okay. I, I think it will have no substantive effect because right. the executive session, since the contract is executed, the yeah. reasons for keeping it confidential no longer exist. That's, that's the other part of it right, that's. But yeah. if we want to go ahead and vote. To repeat our vote in executive so session has, okay. has, we can has no won't have any substantive effect. Okay. But, All we right. can, but we can do it if, if it if you feel like it will put us in well, we have a motion to better position in terms of we have a motion. And okay. second it. So all those in favor in open session say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Any abstentions? Okay. Okay. So uh, that's um, Final item that we have is there any new business, Ms. Minnick? Um, I don't know if the rest of the committee is aware. I only just became aware, woke up, and realized that there are a number of revisions to the charter that are suggested coming before the electorate for a vote in November, and several of those proposed revisions affect school committee members, and I think you should be aware of them. Uh, particularly that school committee members will have a two-year term, not four-year term for ward representatives, which means that there would be no staggered uh, chain turnover and you could conceivably have an entirely new school committee every two years, that no city employee may serve as a school committee representative. And in the past, we have had city employees serve. I, I Jim Dostal worked at the I had to stop being a substitute in Northampton. You can't be a school, school. Per employee, but well, city Jim Dostal was I, I'm uh, sorry. superintendent of this, what you call it, plant, yeah. and served on the school committee for years. Um, and also the charter changes the appointing authority for subcommittees and other um, positions within the school committee, and I think that I personally believe that all three of these things will have a negative impact on the functioning of the school com committee, and so I just want to make people aware of it. We did look it up, and there is no provision in the, in the current um, charter for who appoints the committees. That's in our bylaws, and so this would mean that the charter and the bylaws are in conflict. There was no change to the number of votes, by the way. I did look that up, or how many signatures you needed. Right. Was I didn't change. Too. That's why I didn't change. I think this is appropriate for new business. Um, th this meeting has caused me to think that you know we really need to have more frequent, shorter meetings. Um, when you look at the agenda for tonight, there is no way it could end on time. 
And um, I think we've sort of boxed ourselves into this when we we found that we were basically rehashing all the subcommittee meetings at, at, at the full committee. But then we, um, so we eliminated the subcommittee meetings because they were being re reduplicated. But we didn't really do anything to deal with the fact that we were doing it all here at the full committee. And uh, we've had, um, what is it, half of our meetings recently have gone this late. And I think it's a detriment to, good decision making, good discussion, to public participation. Um, I think we should, uh, I don't know what the right way to take this up is, but I think we should open a discussion about scheduling regularly scheduled bi-monthly meetings as opposed to regularly scheduled monthly meetings with the occasional bi-monthly meeting. Howard, I agree with you. I think we should discuss it, but in the meantime, I'm going to move that we return. No, no. To be, well, we to be arranged, uh, date for the doesn't it say future meetings? Yeah. To be determined. Property. Yeah. Right, it's 1024 at 1 p.m. At 1 p.m. Yeah. Okay. Now I'll move to adjourn. There's been a motion made and seconded to adjourn. Uh, all those in favor say aye.